Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm here to welcome everybody to our illustrious forum tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period where Charlie and anybody else with an announcement for the relevancy of the college can speak uh, and an announcement only. This is just an inform informal national part. Then we'll have our speaker, Bryn, who will then speak up to about an hour on her uh, topic tonight. And then we'll have a question and answer period where we'll have questions and not statements or whatever, because after that, We'll then have a rebuttal period where you get a chance to say your piece for up to a certain specified amount of time. And then Bryn will get the uh, last word and we'll try to finish up about nine o'clock or so. There are two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time. Second is no personal attacks. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, but I usually wind up doing so anyway. <laughs> All right, Charlie, uh, you have the platform. The announcements are yours. Uh, I'll share my screen and go ahead and we'll uh, start them when you're ready. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,675 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, first of all, once again, we have an email, a Google email group, which you are invited to join instructions, top center of our website as well as a meetup group, which you'll get one or two messages per week on the upcoming topics. Very little traffic. Now, although I am not a commun capitalist, I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our next week's programs, our upcoming programs. On July 23rd, we're gonna have Eco Topics, the Citizens Climate Lobby, got a PowerPoint together and they're anxious to tell us about their efforts to stop climate change, global warming. Okay, that's on the 23rd. On the 30th, the Libertarian Party will be returning and will be discussing their recently adopted political party platform, which was just adopted at their convention uh, later in the summer. Uh, transitioning to April the 6th, uh, we're going to have an academic lecturer from Illinois Wesleyan uh, uh, on discussing the philosophy of money, the philosophy of money or philosophies of money. August the 13th, Brian Dennehy is the lawyer, uh, candidate for attorney general of Cook County. Uh, Will is putting together a program on constitutional issues, which are uh, certainly topical these days, uh, gun control, uh, the abortion, and so forth. Uh, on August the 20th, we have an open date. If you'd like to speak or have not spoken before, this would be a good time uh, to speak to the college. I have some invitations outstanding. On August the 27th, we're going to look at the, at the possibility of installing what is called community solar. Instead of having units on everyone's houses, you have arrangements and a number of uh, yeah. your neighbors uh, could, could put together a, a uh, cell mop. Uh, okay, uh, please, will everyone mute? Uh, themselves. Michael, that includes you. Um, okay, that's on August the 27th. On September the 3rd, uh, our special Labor Day speaker uh, will be yours truly. I got together unquestionably one of the better PowerPoints I have ever done looking at the history of the factory. Are they good or are they bad? This is a very interesting program, I think. Yeah. And crossing out, we have three dates open in September. So if you'd like to get on the schedule, please send me a title and a short description and we'll get you on the schedule. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. Take it away. 
Okay, is there anybody else who has a relevant announcement for this college group? <laughs> if not, if not, Bryn, you're uh, welcome to speak and uh, share your screen and uh, let's get started with your presentation. Again, during her presentation, let's mute and uh, let her have her full speak, okay? All right, Bryn, the chair is yours. All right, thank you very much. All right, can you see my slides? Yes, you got them? yes Excellent. we can. Okay, uh, so the title of my book is American Fascism, How the GOP is Subsur Subverting Democracy. Uh, it's available through transgresspress.org. I included the um, website in the chat. Okay, why, there we go. All right, so quick, quick bit about my background. I uh, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1997, the Naval Aviator. Uh, I spent some time in Fifth Fleet headquarters in Iraq in 2004, 2000, or 2005, 2006. Um, a senior defense analyst with a think tank that I can't name. Um, I've been an editorialist on LGBT issues since 2012. Uh, biggest feather in my cap is um, Essentially, I worked on the trans military issue. Um, and let me see, why is it not scrolling? Okay. You having, you're having some trouble? Yeah, I, I got it figured out. Okay. Okay. So, in the preface of the book, I talk about. Um, I studied how the religious right plan, what the religious right plans for LGBT people and particularly trans people um, prior to writing this book. Uh, I mapped out weaknesses in civil rights in the fall of 2016 and came to the conclusion that civil rights in the US could implode catastrophically very quickly um, with a government and uh, that was dedicated to it and a Supreme Court that was ambivalent. Gosh, wow, look at you know the past couple of weeks. Um, there was a conversation I had before the 2016 election with a friend who was in the LGBT movement. And it essentially went something along the lines of Trump could win. No, he's not going to win. Yeah, but what if he does? Yeah, we'll muddle through. We'll figure something out. The truth of the matter was, is we never did figure something out. There never was an effective answer to Trump other than let him blunder around until he became unpopular enough that Biden barely squeaked out a win against him, which uh, is indictment enough in itself. Uh, we knew that Trump would be catastrophic. We knew that the damage he did would be potentially permanent. Uh, even though he's out of office, a lot of the damage that he did is still there, uh, including in places like the Inspector General's offices and the three Supreme Court justices that he got put on the court who have essentially ended um, uh, the right to abortion, have rewritten the way we think about civil rights legally, um, have opened up to gerrymandering and voter suppression. Um, the, the damage that's being done is going to last a very, very long time, likely longer than I'm going to live. So this book I started out as a way of looking at how to fix things. And after two years of trying to figure out, well, how do we fix the damage that's being done? I reached the conclusion that actually fixing the damage is gonna be damn near impossible. And this is gonna go into why. Um, and part of it is the his we look at the history of democratic decline in the US and it, this book is different in that it tries to take a very holistic look. It looks at um, not just history, but demographics, media, um, psychology, um, econometrics. Um, it looks at the history of fascism. It looks at similar case studies, um, particularly Hungary, Russia, Poland, Turkey, but Hungary being the best of the best of the bunch. And then it tries to take a rather logical look at why in a very structural way, it's so difficult for us to recover from this. So the book starts out by looking at what I would term the original sin and has been called elsewhere, which is slavery and racism. Um, when you get down to it historically, that's where this all starts. Um, if you look and the role of religion in racism and slavery uh, points out that the Southern Baptist Convention was created as a split between the Northern Baptists and Southern Baptists in 1845 over whether or not 
uh, slavery was moral and whether a person who owned slaves could be moral. And the Southern Baptist Convention was established primarily to be a way to, for better lack of a better term, uh, whitewash uh, slavery and make it something that was not just moral but commanded by God. Uh, going back, looking at the failure of Reconstruction, uh, what it was was justice in name only. Uh, it was look the Supreme Court trying to create things and states creating things that were neutral on their face, but absolutely weren't, um, and which ended up creating Jim Crow and the, the, the response to the Yellow Peril and the deportation of Mexican-Americans who were American citizens by the hundreds of thousands in the 30s. But essentially what we had between about 1876 and 1954 was a Supreme Court that was um, completely uninterested in civil rights or human rights. And that's where we're going again. But um, it helps to understand how plausibly ugly future for America is if we understand how we've already done this once before with a court that had thought some of the same ways. What's scary, this is going outside the book a bit, but the kind of rationales being used by the Supreme Court now in the, in the Dobbs versus Jackson decision um, are taking us into some very strange legal areas where the Supreme Court is using, well, what would they have thought in 1500? This is a novel legal theory that even the Taney Court that gave us Dred Scott, right, didn't even use those kinds of legal thoughts and tests. So we're going in a very bad direction there. Um, one thing that the book points out is that the complete disenfranchisement of Blacks led to artificial stability between roughly 1900 and 1955. Um, basically, whites agreed that they were going to let the South do whatever they wanted to Blacks, and that was going to, uh, that allowed a period of artificial stability where both sides agreed to put upon minorities in order to let white people rule for themselves, and that um, that prevented revisitation of the issues. It wasn't until um, Brown versus Board of Education that everything kind of fell apart with this artificial truce. So one of the things that I talk about that's, that's facilitated the decline of American democracy is the rise of the religious right. Um, this came about in great part uh, starting with the desegregation of the military uh, the beginning of the Civil, uh, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Um, the people that were opposed to the Civil Rights Movement were primarily white Southern evangelicals, AKA the people who decided to make slavery ordained by God a uh, hundred years ago. Nixon exploited these grievances. We should all know about this as part of the Southern strategy to try and capture Southern Democrats and bring them into the fold of the Republican party because the truce uh, over civil rights had been broken when blacks were re-inducted into the po political, uh, into American politics. Um, and I'm going very fast here because there's a lot of material. Um, something to point out was that uh, abortion was a total non-issue for most religious groups uh, before about 1980. Um, as late as 1976, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention supported uh, abortion. Um, the real issue that managed to pull in uh, white evangelicals into the fold of the Republican Party was Reagan appealing to them about uh, them losing the tax exemption for segregated religious schools. Um, and this, this was the top issue for white evangelicals. And Reagan recorded them um, during his 1980 campaign. Um, you go back to one of his speeches and he never mentions abortion, but he does talk extensively about um, schools, retain, uh, schools retaining their tax exempt status. Um, just a quick reminder, the moral majority um, was founded in, uh, was founded in like 80 or can 81. You, can you put the full screen version of your slides, please. Sorry to interrupt. I don't know how to do that. Tim, can you tell her?
the top left where it says full screen or something. Could it be that little box on the bottom that Is that says better? Yeah, as, as okay. I think it's the little box on the bottom that can make it full. Is, is that is that next is that to the good pen now? on the bottom? Is that good now? Is that no, good now? It hasn't changed. No, it's, it's the same. It's the same right now. See okay. at the bottom, there's a pin, and it it looks like you're only one fourth of the screen. Yeah, the the, the, the key Under right now is that you have um you have two pages on the screen where it would be more helpful. We only have one page. So if you can just you can just only show one page. Is that and I. Yeah, see, see if you can try the icon next to the pen or next to the screen slash. Either one of those things might be able to just get you to one page. Next to the magnifying there at the- Second to the left. Yeah, bottom left. Bottom left. Now we don't see her at all, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I think she's, try, she's just trying to play with it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See. That's a little yeah. better. Yeah, now, now. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, in, in so do, do full screen just on one page, one page on the on the PowerPoint or whatever that presentation is. Is that at the top now? Or? It's not a big deal uh, if you can't figure out how to do it. There oh, it is. That's yeah, it. That's, that's, it. It. that's it. That's it. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, more majority in the 80s, uh, Falwell, um, Paul Weyrich. Something interesting about Weyrich is he created both the, helped create them, he was a Catholic. Uh, he helped create the moral majority. He also created the uh, uh, ALEC, and he also created the Heritage Foundation. Um, and the moral majority faded out, but what we saw as the Southern Republicans took over the party. We saw this kind of bare knuckled, uh, win at all costs kind of mentality um, that was expressed in a 1978 speech by Gingrich where he told his audience, we're in a war, we're in a war for power, right? And this was a fundamental shift in American politics away from um, kind of a give and take, uh, cutting deals to no, no retreat, no surrender. This is a war for power and there will be no compromise. Right. Um, I mean, if anybody remembers Reagan, Reagan would do deals with Tip O'Neill. Such kind, such deals would be unimaginable today. So we're depend, abandoning democracy. Um, what happened is eventually the religious right, uh, which had come to control the Republican Party, realized that they had lost the war culturally in America. Um, they, Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down sodomy laws. Um, the failure during the Bush administration to ban abortion, um, basically convinced them that no, they would never have the support that they wanted. And then after that came the legalization of gay marriage in Massachusetts. Something that we also saw was starting in the late 90s, the religious right started to try and work with Putin. Um, they started forging ties with Russia, looking to create more culturally conservative religious, um, Judeo-Christian societies, um, and that that gave them the idea that, well, you know, you know, democracy is great and all, but winning the culture war is more important. You know, if, if, we, if we have democracy, but we're not a nation for God, is it even worth it? And the answer that the religious right came up with is no. It's more important to be a Christian nation than it is to be a democracy. And that was something that they got from observing Putin and the theories of Alexander Dugan. And I'm blowing through stuff here. This is all cited in the book. Um, so along comes the Tea Party, 2010. Um, and it's scary, crazed, reactionary, deluded. Um, it's, and it is primarily a white Southern evangelical movement. Um, and its goal was to drag the Republican Party to the right. And it did so by uh, annihilating uh, theoretically center-right Republican leadership like Eric Cantor and John Boehner. Um, along with this went the rise of conspiracy theories on the right. 
Uh, one of my favorite ones is that uh, Barack Obama is gay, Michelle Obama is transgender, and that their two kids are stolen uh, from somewhere in Kenya, right? It, it just got more and more bizarre, but they would believe anything. And we'll talk about the media ecosystem that allowed for this um, coming up soon. Um, to talk about Trump, Trump was the, you know, to, to use a phrase by Michael Moore, he was the fuck you candidate. His outlook was Gingrichian. Uh, he sounded more like uh, Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity than any politician, even, um, even Ted Cruz, who is fairly far to the right, who still kind of sounds like a politician. Um, and the way I described it is, is Donald Trump was kind of the avatar of white Southern evangelical it. He is what they wanted in a politician who was going to fight and was going to sound like what they wanted to hear. And that's not a good thing because what they wanted was they wanted an authoritarian who existed to own the libs. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the media and how this played into the, the deconstruction of American democracy over the past 30 years, right? So the end of the fairness doctrine gave us Rush Limbaugh in 88 or 89. Um, by the early 90s, Rush Limbaugh had uh, 20 million listeners. Um, and he was given credit for the 1994 red wave election that brought Gingrich and his group to power. They even held a special event for him at Camden Yards uh, after the election. Um, he, uh, his, he told the audience that, um, that we need to keep a few liberals alive so we can put them in zoos and see what these people are really like. So give you an idea of how uh, political discourse had degenerated. Fox News came up in 1996. Um, one of the founders of it was, you have Rupert Murdoch, but you also had Roger Stone involved. Um, and it created a news ecosystem that was essentially the fire hose of falsehood model used by Russia. And it's gotten worse over time. Um, study about a decade ago, and it's only gotten worse since, has found that watching Fox, that it, when they gave current events tests to subjects, they found that watching Fox News was worse than watching or reading nothing whatsoever, that the information was just so blatantly skewed that one could not perceive reality based on it. Um, it and it creates people who are fundamentally ungrounded from reality. And during the Trump administration, it became the de facto state media. Uh, and over 90% of the interviews that Trump gave to US media were to Fox News. That's not a good thing either. Um, if you, we'll talk about it later, but um, in Hungary, there is effectively no um, independent news outlet, outlets left. And what's come to happen as a result of the changes in American media and the fact that uh, the GOP base um, exists in media and information stovepipes is that you end up with a kind of tribal epistemology and rejection of outside information where people, if they hear something that they don't want to hear, they cannot absorb it and that they are not allowed to learn information from sources outside what's blessed by their tribe. And again, this makes them highly susceptible to being told things that simply aren't true, which is absolutely great if you're a fascist. If you need people to believe, you know, uh, that you know Jews are poisoning the wells, and the state media says it, and everybody that's on your side believes that anything you hear outside of state media is lies. Well, what are you going to believe? Um, real quick, uh, three concepts: pravda, esteem, and branio. Uh, pravda, truth. Uh, from a certain point of view. Um, the way I use it is if anybody follows Star Wars, um, you know, Darth Vader, you know, betrayed and murdered her father is true from a certain point of view. That's Pravda. Estina is the ground truth, the fundamental truth, the unalterable, unspinnable truth that Darth Vader is Luke's father. Vranya loosely translates as useful bullshit. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of what we're seeing with the information being put out isn't to make everyone believe the lies, but it is to make your true believers believe what you want them to believe. You want to put out enough useful bullshit 
that something like the middle third is completely incapable of discerning what the truth is because they're hearing two sides and they lack the skills, knowledge, and sources to separate out the, the bullshit from the truth. So they go, you know what? I don't know. I give up. The truth is unknowable. I, I can't figure this out. And then just become apathetic, right? And then there's going to be a last third that's still going to want to know the truth. Um, but they end up being incapable of countering um, the right-wing authoritarian movement. So I mentioned the fire hose of falsehood. Um, it's, this is a study put out by the Rand Corporation. Um, and it found that with Russian propaganda, there's really kind of four central tenets of it, that it's high volume and multi-channel. So you're getting, um, it's loud, it's obnoxious, it's great graphics, um, and you see it multiple places. It's rapid, continuous, and repetitive, right? And you hear the same things over and over and over again, right? Um, lacking commitment to objective reality. It doesn't need to be true. It just needs to be believable, right? Um, and it lacks commitment to consistency. So even if something comes up that it proves what they just said isn't true, they can rapidly shift to a new lie or re-spin it um, to something else. Um, and that's what we see in Russian propaganda is very much what we see with Newsmax, OAN, Breitbart, uh, the Federalist, Fox, etc. Um, just a little bit of a few quotes. Uh, my books is sprinkled with quotes here and there. Um, the book quotes extensively from Hannah Arendt, the author of um, uh, Origins of Totalitarianism and her account of the trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1962, I believe. Uh, I also quote extensively from um, Chernobyl uh, the H uh, and Valery Legazov. But this one is the one that I think is most important. He tells you what you want to hear. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounds good, so fuck it. Right, and that's kind of, kind of the summation of how good propaganda for the right works and why it's so effective. So we also talk a little bit, the book also talks a little bit about how subject matter expertise, academia, scientists have been systematically de discredited by, for decades by the GOP. Uh, Rush Limbaugh specifically singled them out for his uh, listeners, right? Um, the GOP over time has become a less educated party. Um, now the, the majority of people who hold college degrees are Democrats uh, by, by a fairly significant margin. Um, as of a year ago, uh, almost 60% of Republicans believe that colleges are bad for America and don't want their kids to go to college or they only want them to go to Hillsdale or some other right-wing conservative Christian um, college or university. Um, the, there's, they want ideological tests in federal government. Uh, this includes things like climate change. Uh, we saw that with the Trump administration where they systematically rooted out anyone who subscribed to climate change at places like the USDA um, or the State Department, uh, religious freedom. Um, they were specifically looking for people who believed that freedom of religion, specifically conservative Christian beliefs, is the only real human right besides the Second Amendment. Um, if we look at the Trump cabinet, um, they destroyed their own agencies to try and root out anyone who was an expert or had opinions that would run counter to the administration on ideological grounds. In a lot of ways, uh, this reminded me of the old Soviet Union's attachment to Lamarckian evolution, where it was assumed that um, the right, if you had the right ideology, you would always get the right answer. And if Lamarckian evolution was the one that conformed more, more closely to communism, that obviously eventually Lamarckian evolution would prove to be correct because it was in line with communism, which was infallible. Right, um, and we've kind of reached that here in the U.S. Except everything has to pass a religious litmus test, a conservative white evangelical litmus test, and that we've ended up with kind of this belief that government and experts are bad in general, 
Um, and this is extremely dangerous because running a modern nation uh, requires a great deal of expertise, particularly in a dynamic environment where we're dealing with things like climate change. Um, and an example of this is that there was a um, robust plan for pandemic response uh, that had been left behind by the Obama administration and it got thrown out on day one of the Trump administration. And so when we did get hit by a pandemic, there was nobody left who had any idea what they're doing and there was no plan. Um, they were scrambling from day one when the work had already been done for them because the assumption was as well, Obama is bad and Democrats are bad. Therefore, anything they did on public health must be bad. Therefore, chuck it. So a couple of quick things here um, that I cite. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is essentially people who are not experts and not particularly smart tend to vastly overrate rate their own expertise and intelligence. Uh, some of the funniest ones were that 30% uh, of Republicans said that we should bomb the kingdom of Agrabah uh, in 2016, and 60% of uh, Trump voters said we should bomb Agrabah. The thing is, is Agrabah is the fictional kingdom from the Disney film Aladdin. 72% um, of Republicans said that Arabic numerals should not be taught in schools, except the thing is, is Arabic numerals are what we already use and have used for hundreds of years. So there's this kind of uh, dedication to big bigotry and ignorance that's kind of rampant within the Republican Party. And that's extremely dangerous because it leads to reactionary actions uh, towards anything they perceive as, as bad without any particular thought. So one of the things that I talk about in detail is, is that the GOP uh, destruction of faith in experts' expertise um, has led the U.S. to have a very uh, ineffective response to the pandemic, which has ended up killing about 1.05 million people at this point, which matches up with the worst case scenarios that were posited at the beginning. And we can all remember these. Um, one of the more interesting things is that analysis uh, by either Harvard or Yale, no, it was MIT, excuse me, it was MIT, uh, showed that Trump's tweets turned out to be the top source of misinformation during the pandemic. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that uh, there was a book published right before the pandemic started. Uh, by a woman who is an epidemiologist. And she found that there were four things that generally lead to governments to fail at handling the pandemic, which is deny that the disease is a problem, suppress scientific information, blame minorities, and claim that those who fall ill are doing so because they are sinners or bad or something is wrong with them. And the US ended up with at least three of these, if not the fourth. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the demographics of the Republican party that makes them so particularly dangerous um, and why they're so prone to both authoritarianism and to um, bad governance decisions or decisions that are way out of step with what the rest of the American public wants. Um, the Republican, your average Republican um, cannot win without the white evangelical vote, just can't. They are close to 50% of the party, some coming in at something like 46%. So realistically, if you don't have them on your side, you're not gonna make a lot of headway because they tend to vote um, along with the second largest block, which is white conservative Catholics. Um, something that researchers have found is that white evangelicals have authoritarian and social dominance orientation group traits. Um, and what social dominance orientation is, is essentially a belief that certain groups of people are more, should be on top of society, deserve more societal respect, are intrinsically better within a society. And that can include on grounds of race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, um, sex, any of, the, any of these things make them feel like, well, these people, people like me are more worthy of power in the, than these other people who are less worthy. I should be on top. So anything that threatens that position on top 
is seen as a, an existential threat, right? Um, when you look at white evangelicals and their beliefs, their beliefs are outliers on race, on LGBTQ issues, on abortion, on Me Too, on guns, immigration, Muslims, right? White evangelicals are very, very distinct from the rest of the US population in terms of what they believe and their beliefs are uniformly far more conservative than just about than any other group. And the other groups that are just as conservative as them are either really small or don't participate in US politics, which would include Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. So they've we know that they've actively worked to install judges and legislatures to eliminate the separation of church and state. We've seen that in the most recent Supreme Court rulings. The last term we got not just one, but two. Uh, rulings that that uh, weakened or dissolved separation of church and state. We found out that religious uh, activists were having dinner with, with uh, conservative justices from 2015 onwards. So there is an active attempt to end that separation. And they, they want this. They want America to be a Christian nation. Um, and that they want religious freedom to be the only real civil right All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about wealth equality. And I'm sorry I'm jumping around, but the, what I'm trying to show you here is that there are lots and lots of different factors that are all pressing us towards authoritarianism. And that type of authoritarianism is a very specific brand of right-wing populism that is best termed fascism. But we're gonna talk a little bit about wealth inequality and how that makes things worse and pushes us towards an authoritarian government. Um, so in the United States, wealth and income inequality, inequality are growing. Average white family has a net worth of 10 times the average black family. It's getting worse. Um, the, the odds of ending up better off than your parents are dropping. So Gen Z, at, millennials have a less than 50-50 shot of being better off than their parents. And for Generation Z, that's gonna be even worse. Show you a graph on that in just a second. Uh, we're also seeing social mobility dropping, which is correlated with what I just told you. Um, essentially, it's getting harder and harder to move up or down the ladder. You can be, if you're born rich, you have to screw up at an extraordinary rate to end up poorer. Um, high wealth inequality is correlated with some really bad things, which includes lower life expectancy, which we're seeing in the United States, higher incarceration rates, U.S., more drug use, yes, increased homicide rates, yep, going on, lower educational performance, oh yeah, less democratic governments. Yep. So what we're seeing is correlated. Now, does one cause the other or as, do they go lockstep or is there some mechanism there? Can't say that, but um, they do appear to be interrelated phenomena. So one, one quick thing to show here is the top 10% are making far more money than they used to. Uh, we haven't seen uh, the top 10% making this much uh, ever really. Um, we're back to the Gilded Age in terms of wealth inequality. Um, what you can see here is that there are, um, there's a correlation between wealth inequality and lack of social mobility. Oops. Um, and this is just an illustration of the odds of ending up better off than your parents based off of the year you were born. And yeah, you can see the trend here. Um, and this is all interrelated. So let's talk about what this means and try and link this wealth inequality with how it ends up making government less democratic and more prone to authoritarianism, right? So a few years back, uh, a couple of academics named Gillens and Page found that the US is no longer uh, a democracy and their study showed that popular support for legislation has zero impact on legislative outcomes. However, when they compared that with uh, what the, how wealthy people uh, felt about specific legislative items had a measurable impact on it, that the, more, that the more wealthy people supported legislation, the more likely it was to get passed. Um, and that was kind of a, hmm, that was, that was a big deal when it came out. Um, there's a book out there that I like very, very much uh, uh, called Let Them Eat Tweets by Hacker and Pearson. Uh, it identified three threats to democracy 
via oligarchy and wealth inequality, which is unequal power, which Gillens and Page has already alluded to uh, and discussed, right? So you've got the wealthy have more power when it comes to passing legislation. You also have the problem is, is what happens when the elite, what the elite want diverges from what society needs, right? Um, if you know, Jeff Bezos decides that he needs to hunt people, you know, in a, you know, the, the most dangerous game style and people don't want that, but, you know, Jeff Bezos gets that. Well, if the wealthy get what they want and there's only a tiny fraction and, and what people actually need doesn't happen, that's bad for society as a whole and starts taking us down the road to oligarchy and some of the side effects that we saw elsewhere um, in the previous slide. Um, the other one is that when elites are afraid of democracy, or are, are, when elites get afraid, they are willing to take anti-democratic measures to ensure that their interests are still put at the top. And we're going to see some examples of that in a second. Um, Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, cites regulatory capture as a danger, i.e. that one particular party or when the elites and the wealthy dictate um, what happens with regulations um, and are able to control how policy and regulations uh, are implemented uh, and reject those that they don't like, that's also a significant danger to a democracy. And I think most of us would agree that that's a significant issue. Um, oligarchs traditionally have leveraged social conservatives for votes. Um, we see this in Hungary, we see this in Russia, we see this, um, we see this in Turkey. Um, and the reason that they tend to unite is they both see democracies as preventing them from getting what they want. Oligarchs want to get wealthier and social conservatives want to see a country where their social views are the basis for all law and policy. Um, and there's a great quote by Hannah Arendt. Um, the aristocracy in a desperate last struggle tried to ally itself with conservative forces of the churches, the Catholic Church in Austria and France, the Protestant churches in Germany, under the pretext of fighting liberalism with the weapons of Christianity. The mob was the only means to strengthen their position, to give their voices greater resonance. Um, and this is Hannah Arendt, a Jewish woman, if you're not familiar, who fled Germany when things started getting, getting hot in 1934. Uh, never went back and she ended up writing the origins of totalitarianism, which is considered one of the seminal documents on how the Holocaust happened, how Germany went from the Weimar Republic to Nazi Germany. But they discovered that anti-Semitic slogans were highly effective in mobilizing large strata of the population. And my book doesn't talk about trans issues much, but we're seeing the same kinds of mobilization now, um, except it's being directed at trans people LGBT people, immigrants. So let's talk about what the Republican Party is doing such that they assume power and never relinquish it using their base. Um, demographics don't favor the GOP in the long run. Uh, white people are gonna become the minority uh, in the US sometime around 2044, depending, you know, give or take a couple of years. Um, right now, the Republican Party holds all the adva electoral advantages or are deliberately making them worse. This includes gerrymandering, voter suppression, an adva advantage in the electoral college, non-proportional representation, the urban-rural political divide, which makes it much harder to draw uh, fair maps or to have anything resembling proportional representation. Um, and it also makes things worse in the Senate. It also makes things worse in the House because everybody gets at least one, one representative. It makes things worse in the electoral college. So Republicans have all these built in structural advantages that allow them to assume power uh, with less votes. And then once they do hold power, particularly with gerrymandering and voter suppression, they can retain power essentially indefinitely as long as they don't lose by more than 12 to 15 points. Um, given the polarization in the US today and given the fact that there's a lot of people getting um, cultural goodies handed to them, um, seeing those kinds of margins happen are unlikely. This is why we, there's uh, states like Wisconsin and North Carolina where we have extreme gerrymanders that the Supreme Court has okayed, um, allow Republicans to control state legislatures indefinitely regardless of how people vote. Um, 2018, they lost the popular vote by about eight and a half percent in Wisconsin and still held a supermajority. 
Uh, just to give you an idea, the Electoral College skews about four to five points in favor of Republicans. And in the Senate, it skews about five to six points. And now it's up to almost seven. This is older data. Um, it should be noted that for Democrats to uh, have a filibuster proof majority in the Senate, they would have to win three elections in a row by an average of about 16 and a half percentage points on the national vote every cycle. <laughs> Simply not going to happen. Um, Republicans have been much more aggressive in their gerrymandering, um, in, their, in their election rigging. There's been 253 bills in 43 states just after the 2020 election, and we've seen that continue in 2021. Um, this is happening very, very aggressively to make sure that they stay in power regardless of how people vote. Um, and if you look at what's happening at the Supreme Court with uh, Moore versus Harper, which is the independent state legislature, theory being tested. Uh, if they win that, it's game over. Um, state legislatures can essentially overrule uh, voters and send any electors that the state legislature wants, even though the legislature uh, was gerrymandered into being what it is. Um, and this is extremely dangerous and people aren't picking up on it. But the big takeaway here is that the Republican Party is very much in a position to assume permanent power over the United States, regardless of how people vote. And that's actually their intention. Um, Supreme Court's only making it worse. You look at cases like Gill versus Whitford. I uh, look at them granting certain Moore versus Harper. Um, look at them um, throwing their hands up in the air and saying we can't do anything to address uh, fundamental inequalities or injustices. And what we have is a increasingly anti-democratic system that's increasingly unpopular with the public and the Supreme Court's uh, approval rating is down to 25%, lowest it's ever been in polling history. Uh, we are losing faith in our government and for good reason. All right, just a few quotes here. Uh, I'll give you a moment. Um, actually, I'm gonna go back up. There's one quote I missed. Um, I, no longer uh, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Peter Thiel, billionaire and Trump supporter, he's been pumping close to a billion dollars into this election cycle. So there is, a, there is absolutely no desire to retain democracy within the US. In fact, it is a hindrance and there is a, a collaboration between the religious right and the ultra wealthy to end US democracy to get what they want. If conservatives become convinced that they cannot win democratically, they will not abandon conservatism. They will reject democracy. Um, you know you're no longer living in a democracy because the elections in which you're participating can no longer yield political change. Uh, democracy isn't objective, liberty, peace, and prosperity are. We want the human condition to flourish. Rank democracy can thwart that. In other words, you'll be better off with us telling us how to live your life. And we've seen that in the Hobbes versus Jackson decision which apparently making raped 10 year olds carry to term is better for the human condition somehow. Yeah. Okay, uh, what is fascism? So I, I did a meta study and looked at a lot of the top experts and how they characterize fascism. And what I included in my list um, are the things that are broadly agreed upon by the majority of experts as, are, as being characteristics of fascism. Something you need to understand, fascism is not goose-stepping, bad architecture, death camps, silly mustaches, land wars in Asia, or always totalitarian. Fascism mo movements are a form of right-wing populism with certain attitudes, beliefs, belief systems, but every fascist movement is going to reflect the country that they came from. They're going to be a little bit different. Franco's Spain was different from Mussolini's Italy, was different from Hitler's Germany was different from Putin's Russia, is different from Orban's Hungary. They are going to have characteristics of the nation from which they came. In the US, this is going to look very racist. It's going to look very white. It's going to look very evangelical, right? Um, and this is, comes as no surprise. Uh, Sinclair Lewis uh, predicted that that's exactly how fascism would look in 1936. Um, he predicted that it would originate uh, as, as a distinctly Southern uh, style of American politics and beliefs. 
So I'm gonna throw some things up here. Uh, characteristics of fascism, misogyny and sexual anxiety comes out as um, particularly the sexual anxiety is reflected in attitudes towards LGBT people, contempt for the poor, the weak and human rights in general, a belief in a better mythic past followed by a descent into depravity. depravity. This is MAGA, right? America was great until all these woke liberals took over our cities and ruined everything. And now we need to make America great again by eliminating all that wokeism and, and making America good for all the salt of the earth people in, in rural areas again, right? Um, it's anti-egalitarian and xenophobic, right? And it fears changes in the social ordering. Well, this is essentially what the response to the civil rights movement was. Uh, religion and government are intertwined. Yes, absolutely. A uh, rejection of expertise and anti-intellectualism are hallmarks of fascism. Uh, powerful and continuing expressions of nationalism. Literally, the entire Trump foreign policy could be summarized in two words, America first, right? Um, corporate power and the wealthy are protected under fascist systems. Um, and even Hannah Arendt noted this. Uh, suppression of labor. Uh, fascist movements tend to be extremely hostile to labor movements uh, because they're some of the only ways that they can be opposed. Uh, you know, anti-urbanism and agrarianism. Um, fascist movements generally tend to spring out of rural areas because those, those are the real people. Um, and that dates back to you know, Mussolini and Hitler, but we still see it in modern times where um, the majority of support for Victor, uh, Victor Orban in Hungary originates from rural areas outside of Budapest. Um, selective populism headed by a single man from which all political power flows. Uh, Trump tried to do that. We'll see if he manages to hang on, but there aren't a lot of Republicans crossing the lines at this point to denounce him because he still is the leader um, in the polling for the 2024 primaries. Um, enemies are both weak and strong, create a sense of victimhood and power. And there's a sense in fascist movements that some small groups of people have ruined things for everybody else. And that these small groups of people are disgusting and vile, but they're also very, very powerful at the same time, and that they represent an existential threat. In Nazi Germany, it was Jews uh, and Roma, right, and communists, but Jews in particular uh, after about 1936. On the U.S. today, we see that with, with immigrants, uh, his, uh, Latino and Hispanic immigrants, we see that with trans people, we see that more, uh, more talking points about this with LGB people, um, the accusations of being groomers and pedophiles um, and the, the increase in uh, violence and threats of violence against LGBT people. So these are, these are all things that should make you feel deeply, deeply uncomfortable because each of these things that I've listed here are something that the majority of experts on fascism that I found over the past six, 70 years that the majority of them agree are characteristics of fascism and we're kind of experiencing all of them. Um, conspiracy theories um, and propaganda create an unreality that feeds into fears and scapegoating. I forgot that one. Um, and yes, that's absolutely um, a hallmark and it should make you very, very wary because there is a lot of scapegoating going on here and the Republican party is not engaging with real issues. Um, they're much more focused on culture war things like um, shutting down libraries, um, preventing people from getting abortions, um, drag queen story hour. They're not talking about um, they're, they're not talking about uh, infrastructure or declining wages. They're not talking about um, uh, wealth inequality. They're not uh, the climate change. They're not talking about any of the things that actually matter. They need these as distractions, and they need groups of people that they can single out. Um, and that there is a sustained unreality that's been created to keep them in kind of a nice warm cocoon of, of uh, agitprop. So are we, are we fascists? And the conclusion is Trump is in fascism. Is Trump fascist? Is the GOP fascist? Are we a fascist country? And the answer to all of these is yes, 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 and almost. Um, you know, um, Tim Snyder and Ambitara Eco, uh, politics of eternal war explains the danger. There are always scapegoats and enemies. Conflict is, is necessary to unify the people. 
fascist regimes never reach a good enough point and what happens when they achieve their currently stated goals, you know, and then what, what are their unstated goals and what should scare the, scare the hell out of you is that as far as the GOP has gone today, they will keep going as long as they have a scapegoat or an enemy and there is no end state. There's no point where they're going to say good enough. They're going to keep needing to find a new enemy to target um, and push against and oppress or repress or push into the closet. And that's given that they're about to achieve permanent power um, by as soon as 2025, that should be terrifying given that the Supreme Court has more or less abrogated its responsibilities to uphold human and civil rights. So I'm just gonna, when democracies die, right? The kind of the hallmarks of a demining democracy are rejection of democratic rules of the game, denial of the legitimacy of political opponents, um, toleration or encouragement of violence, and a readiness to curtail the civil, liber civil liberties of opponents, including the media. And when this comes from a, uh, a book, How Democracies Die, and when it was written, they said about 14 of the 16 were happening in the US in 2017, and we're now at 16 of 16. So what protects democracies, right? Well, there's hard guardrails, like laws and regulations, right? Um, and courts that supposedly uphold the law uh, in a way that's meant to promote democracy. And you got soft guardrails. These are unwritten rules, things like mutual tolerance. You know, are the, are the people on the other side of the aisle, fellow Americans working to come to a, an agreement to further the interests of the country, or, or are they demonic spawn that needs to be eradicated and pushed from government and pushed from power in order that we can impose our will upon the country for the good of the country as we see it? Um, institutional forbearance. Do you break the game? Do you just, do you play Calvin Ball? And an example of Calvin Ball would be Mitch McConnell saying, oh, we don't nominate justices. We don't vote on justices in the year of an election. And then saying, yeah, I lied. I'll do whatever the hell I want when it came to, to Coney Barrett, right? So yeah, you make the rules, you break the rules. Who cares? There are, you are breaking the game. You are putting um, sycophants and, um, cronies in positions of power in order to, that should be theoretically neutral in order to get your way, right? Um, or doing things like the institute, uh, the independent state legislature theory, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about competitive authoritarianism and it's a system of government that's emerged since the Cold War. Um, and these are countries particularly like Hungary and Russia being the best examples where they still have elections and everybody vo vote gets counted theoretically, but the votes are utterly meaningless because the election has been rigged by all kinds of rules, including gerrymandering or who counts what, or setting up special rules so that you can count rules and count votes in different places. But it's essentially finding a way to make sure that, the, that the, there's elections and votes are counted, but the incumbent party can never be removed from power ever, right? Um, and nobody's holding a gun to anybody's head. Nobody's, you know, um, and something to understand about competitive authoritarianism is there's not gulags, there's not death camps. There's, there isn't a nanny state where everybody's watching you, where if, you know, you whisper in an alley that you don't like Big Brother, you're not gonna end up with a, uh, you know, cage full of rats on your head because that's wasteful. As long as people are voting and lulled into a sense of, well, things might change or just this is the things we are, uh, that as long as things are unpleasant but tolerable, nobody rebels, nobody, nobody does anything because there's still trappings of democracy and some people are getting ahead through, through graft and, being, and, and corruption. So what you end up with is states that are incredibly stable without generally needing to have uh, overwhelming police states. Good examples would be um, Poland and Hungary and Turkey, you could still protest against, you know, Erdogan uh, or the Law and Justice Party, and you're not going to end up in a gulag forever. But the protesting doesn't make any difference. And, and the reason that they don't have these sorts of corrective mechanisms is because it takes money and energy and time, and it can foment even er further uh, discontent. Um, and it's remarkably effective. It's really tough to uh, 
I can't actually say that there's a competitive authoritarian state uh, since 1990 that's recovered and become a democracy again. All right. So the kind of the three ways that you create a competitive autocracy are, are is you capture the referees, i.e. the courts is a good good one, the inspector generals. Um, you sideline key players, right? Um, like the media. Um, ooh, and uh, rewriting the rules. A good example was Mitch McConnell. Uh, you you change the rules for nominating judges. You change the rules for how many people there are on, this, on the court, or you change the rules for how many votes on a court. Um, in Poland, the way the Law and Justice Party did it was that they changed two rules at once to make sure they got their way forever, which was they, they had 10 people on the court, right? And then they changed the rules such that you needed a two thirds majority to get the court to overturn a rule passed by the legislature, but they also put five um, cronies on this Supreme Court guaranteeing that the Supreme Court in Poland would never, ever, ever overrule a law passed by the Law and Justice Party. Um, the, the VDEM project in Sweden shows that countries that have gone as far as the United States have a only a 20% chance of recovery. And this estimate was from two and a half years ago. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, to give some kind of quantitative uh, sense, the solid line at the top is the Democratic Party in the US. This line right here is the GOP and the, the GOP in the United States is only marginally more committed to democracy than the Law and Justice Party in Poland and the Fidesz Party in Hungary. Um, this diagram right here, um, it's a bit of an eye chart, but what it shows is how this is a self-reinforcing system, that all of these different pieces support each other and make it very, very difficult to break the death spiral, right? Um, and if you want to be able to study it in more detail, uh, we can later, but essentially what this shows is it's very, very hard to break the cycle, right? So quick, quick story. Um, let's talk about solutions and why they're so hard. And there's this great fable from Aesop's Fables about a bunch of mice and they don't like the fact that the local cat is eating them. So they call them mouse meeting and they all throw out ideas. And eventually one young mouse gets up and he says, you know, well, what if we put a bell on the cat? That way we'd hear him coming and we wouldn't get eaten anymore. And everybody goes, yes, that's a brilliant idea. That's great. Except one old mouse says, well, I'm, I'm an old mouse, but who's going to put the bell on the cat, right? And that's the problem we face now is, yes, there's lots of brilliant solutions um, that, that have been proposed. And if anyone managed to implement them, they would be fantastic. The problem is, is none of them are actually going to be happen or be implemented because the system itself prevents them very deliberately from happening. And the GOP very much wants to ensure that they don't happen because if they did let them happen, they're their chance at unfettered power forever would go away. So this is a flow chart. And what you need to get out of it is that for a solution to any given problem to happen, it manage it, it needs to make it through this gauntlet, right? And if you think about what it takes to get through this gauntlet for just about anything, you rapidly realize it's not, nothing can get through or very, very little can get through, or what can get through doesn't actually, isn't actually a solution, right? Like the, the gun control legislation that made it through um, is entirely anemic. Yeah, it got through, but the reason it got through is because it's not actually a solution. Um, but virtually any proposed solution is going to die, right? A, a particularly ugly death, whether it's the filibuster, whether it's be, it be because of SCOTUS, whether it's because it will require a change to the constitution, which has absolutely no prayer of getting 38 states to ratify it. It's, it's an ugly, ugly situation. And when people propose solutions that are legislative or policy oriented, it has to make it through this gauntlet and very, very few of them would make it through. And that's what you have to understand. Whenever you propose a solution, uh, it has to go through this, or at least a governmental solution. 
So, you know, Biden's president, and I think you might have noticed that very little positive is happening. Um, January 6th was an explosion. Um, Trump and Trumpism continue to dominate the GOP. The GOP has gotten more authoritarian, not less authoritarian. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Texas and Florida um, and Ohio on with abortion, with LGBT people, you know, and the fact that the Republican Party is willing to tell Disney, we will shut you down rather than let you, you know, uh, be pro LGBT um, is, is reminds me of a quote from the book, which is essentially that um, in, in Nazi Germany, the, the attitude towards businesses were, was essentially, you know, as long as you don't cross the Fuhrer, business will be fine. Cross the Fuhrer, not so much. Same thing with Russia. Putin had absolutely no problem with letting oligarchs stay rich unless they got crosswise with him, in which case they were more than happy to wipe them out. Same thing in, her, in Hungary. And by wipe them out, I mean either impoverish them than imprison them. Necessary change is almost impossible. Uh, we already talked about this, uh, but it's getting, getting to where we need to go. There are no feasible, particularly feasible solutions. Um, when I wrote this back, this sl slide deck in 2020, um, you know, we needed to pass HR1 and HR4, that's the For the People Act um, and the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we needed to prosecute people suspected of crimes during, during the previous administration. Neither of them is happening, okay? Uh, none of them has happened in the window of opportunities closing after, um, after the 2022 election, if it goes anything like we imagine, if we lose the house, there's gonna be probably no prosecutions. Um, the, the, there's been no, uh, Merrick Garland at the DOJ hasn't been moving particularly quickly. We're not seeing a lot of movement on prosecutions anywhere. Um, and the bills are dead effectively because we can't get past the filibuster, all right? Um, yeah, and it's just, it's the things that we needed to do post January 6th to prevent uh, further degradation of democracy have not happened. So the next autocratic attempt is a near certainty. We see that with different states putting um, people in place to overturn elections with the big lie within the Republican party um, stating that you know tr uh, Biden isn't the legitimate president, that there was fraud. Next election, if they don't like the results, they're going to make the same claims, but have the people and laws in place to ignore the vote. Um, and it's much more likely to happen, succeed next time because there's continued radicalization. We're reaching the point where they're, you know, um, the, the, the language being used against LGBT people uh, and immigrants is getting even worse. Um, they've gained experience from the first attempt. Um, they've enhanced their voter suppression and gerrymandering. Um, they've done their groundwork via the courts. The courts are issuing ruling after ruling that's gonna make it more feasible for them to carry out uh, their plans. And they're laying the groundwork to overturn elections. And right now they are more or less successfully doing it most places they're trying. So what do we do after we fall into competitive authoritarianism or competitive autocracy? Well, there's really kind of only two general choices once we hit that point. And it's a descent into hopeless apathy like Russia, Belarus, Hungary, Poland, where you know, yeah, people don't turn out to vote because what's the point? And you can't change the system. And you know, if you did protest too much, yeah, they might shoot you. you know. it's, it's, and it's, you know, what are you gonna do? The, the, you know, um, the, the fundamental of living in a competitive authoritarian system is, is life is mostly boring and tolerable. Um, there's an old Russian joke that, you know, today is an average day, worse than yesterday, better than tomorrow. Um, and that's kind of where we sink to, unless there is some level of rage or desire to do things that are heretofore unthinkable. Um, the other option is a dissolution of the union of some sort whether it's soft secession where blue states cease to recognize the authority of the courts and the federal government under certain circumstances, or they form autonomous regions and say, we're out. But this, this sounds implausible and it probably is given the difficulties um, of, of 
seceding, but the polling data suggests that Republicans in blue states increasingly want to see a split. And we're also seeing the same thing in deep blue states as well, with almost 50% of Democrats in Western states want, uh, wanting to secede and just about 50% in the American South uh, wanting to secede. Um, or Republicans wanting to secede, Democrats in the, in the West, uh, Pacifica. So this, the US is going very, very dark places. The Republicans know what they're doing. They are being particularly methodical about it. They've put, they've put their pieces in place. They've rigged the game. They've, they've bribed the referees or replaced the referees with their own people. And where we're going should be frightening to anyone. Um, if you are one of the groups that falls afoul of this regime, because they will always need scapegoats for why America isn't perfect yet. Um, and that's, that's American fascism. I'm working on a follow-on book called It Will Happen Here, Life in a Post-Democracy America, um, that talks about 2025 and beyond. Um, but this is kind of a review of how we ended up where we are and why we ended up where we are from multiple perspectives, trying to tie all the pieces together rather than just focusing on history or evangelicals or policy or constitutional governance or um, looking at it through a lens of competitive authoritarian regimes. It's trying to tie it all together. So that is kind of the gist of my book and my presentation. Um, we'll open it up now. Can I ask, do we, do we use the hand system or we just jump uh, in? Tim is muted. That's the main problem right now. Oh, okay. I'm unmuted right now. I had that mic on my uh, thing happening. What we're <laughs> going to do is we'll either have a hands raised or the chat or something else. I take down your name for the questioners and I'll go through them real quick. So I'm as moderator, I'm going to ask the first one. Jake, I think that's you, right? I see you there. So you'll go first. After yeah. me. All right. And uh, all right, Bryn, um, I can see you put a lot of time and effort into the book. Um, I would just like to know a little bit about how long it took you to write the book and why you wrote the book, if you don't mind. And then maybe I, I also got onto your website and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Sure. So the book... Uh, the, the genesis of the book was um, an article I wrote right after the election on November 16th called Drums in the Deep, and it took a look at the future, and it was pretty bleak. And then I decided, no, I'm going to try and figure out how do we get ourselves out of this mess. Um, and I spent two years on that. And the conclusion I came to is, is there were no particularly viable solutions, that all the solutions offered um, and they just weren't possible because they would be blocked or they, there's no way for them to happen or the composition of the government or the state or federal government wasn't changeable enough to make them happen um, or they would be blocked by Republicans. Um, and so then I started looking at the book from a more holistic point of view. And in a lot of ways, I would describe the book as therapy, um, that I had to go through the five stages of the grieving process. So there was anger, there was bargaining. Bargaining was me looking for a way out of this. Um, there was, um, you know, there was, let me see, was there's denial? No, this can't be happening. America's special, right? This, this can't be happening. They, 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 surely they wouldn't go that far. You know, and the book was kind of, the, by the time I got to the end of the book, I'd reached the place of acceptance, which is we're probably screwed. Um, and that there's probably not going to be a place in this country for me after about 2025 um, or my family or my trans kid. Um, and that we're going down a path that's well understood, that this is as predictable as, you know, you know, the spread of a disease, um, you know, so there, there was, I've, I've come to a place of this is it. Um, 
there's nothing I can do. Um, you know, one of, uh, I used to be a, a crash scene investigator as my final duty in the, in the reserves. Um, and I had to pick through wreckage to try and figure out whether the aircraft was shot down or whether it was mechanical failure or pilot error. And, you know, one of the most famous um, black box recordings that, that really struck me was, was uh, a pilot uh, who, they're inverted, going 500 knots, 60 degrees nose down, and they have no control over the aircraft. And as they pass through 5,000 feet, they recognize it's, the, there's just nothing. And the last words in the black box recorder are, well, here we go. Um, about, and, it, and the, the, after he says that there's about a half second before the black box cuts out. And I've kind of reached that, well, here we go, kind of um, level of understanding of where we're at. <laughs> okay, we, uh, I thank you very much, Bryn, for answering those questions. It's an interesting proposition book, writing a book and, and it's just a form of therapy. I've known a couple of other authors who've done that myself. Uh, there was one I knew her, oh, never mind. I'll, I'll explain that in rebuttals. We got five questioners. So far, I got Jake, Margaret, Ellen Corley, Dan, and Chris Boss. Okay, Jake, you were, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, a couple questions. What's what? Could you repeat your name and the name of the book again? So my name is Bryn Tannehill, and the name of the book is American Fascism, How the GOP is Subverting Democracy. Okay, now, uh, Robert, Robert. Bryn, Bryn Tannehill? Is that, is that Tannehill. Correct? Like uh, like the quarterback yeah. uh, who used to play for Miami. Uh, okay. And my second question, what... what um, could you describe in more detail what's going on in Poland to follow you there? So what's going on in Poland is that we have a religious right, heavily uh, Orthodox Catholic party that's come to power. Um, and they came to power and they rapidly rewrote the rules, added judges, made it very, very difficult um, with changes to election rules to remove them. The, the, the unfortunate acronym for them is PIS, which stands for Law and Justice Party. Um, the, the only good thing about what's going on in Poland is that the leader, current leader Duda, um, is extremely anti-Russian and he blames the death of his brother on Russia, which is why we're seeing Poland being one of the leaders against Russia in, in Ukraine. Um, but what we're seeing, Poland was one of the first countries we've seen before the U.S. to go backwards on abortion and, and abortion is effectively banned in, um, Poland at this point. The big difference is, is that um, being in the EU, um, people can go elsewhere and there's, and it would be against the EU charter for Poland to block people from leaving the country to get an abortion. Okay. okay. All, right. All right, Jake. Bren, I, that, what's that brand of microphone you're using? I'm just curious because you must do a lot of media interviews. Um, I don't know. It was $63.99 um, at Best Buy. <laughs> No, it, 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 it just looks like you've done a lot of Zoom interviews and things like that. I've looked at your website already because I got on a computer. We move on. All right. Now, that's what we're doing, Charlie. All right. I got Margaret, Ellen Corley, Dan, Chris Boss, and Robert. So, Margaret, you're next. Yeah, I would like to know um, some, some of your citations because I noticed the graphs that you put up didn't really have where you got them from. And then, I don't have. They're all, they're all cited in the book. Um, I don't, I don't, in the book. And they're all you, cited. Yes. They, they, can they, you tell me where you got the number of hundreds of thousands of um, uh, Mexican pe people of Mexican descent who were born in the United States who were deported? Now I do know that 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 there were several hundreds, and there may have been th a thousand, but I didn't hear hundreds of thousands, which is what you said. So I was just wondering where you got that number. Uh, I would have to, I would have to go back and, and bring up the book. And I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the book, but there were deportations of uh, Americans, uh, American citizens. The yes. exact number is unknown, um, but yeah, I, I would have to, I would have to look it up. Um, but, no, I, I would agree with you on that, absolutely, because I actually saw documentation of that at the uh, National Mexican or the Museum of National 
National Museum of Mexican Art <coughs> here in Chicago. <coughs> they had documentation on that. They had pictures of people being lined up to put on a bus, but you don't ex, uh, deport hundreds of thousands of people on a bus. So I, you know, I just didn't know where you got that number. Oh yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned that one in the book uh, that was off the top of my head. Okay, well. I, but I know that there was a systemic deportation of Mexican Americans in the 30s and 40s, particularly under the Roosevelt administration. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, uh, Ellen, you're next. Ellen Corley, you're next. Okay, um, am I, wait a minute, am I on? Oh, yeah. just one okay. thing, you're most, on. Of the, most of the graphs that I have, most of the graphs and charts that I have in there um, come from peer reviewed um, uh, journal articles. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, just before I ask my question, do you, you do have a website and can we get the PowerPoint slides? I, this is so e excellent. Um, and if you email them to me, I'll uh, make sure that the whoever asked. Yeah, I'll email things. them to you. I generally don't like giving out my email. Sorry. Oh, I get as it no, is. But I mean, I'm just saying you can email them to me and I can make sure the participants get them. I also okay. know too, you have a contact through your uh, website contact Bryn Tannehill. Yes. And so uh, I'll type can, in my website. Um, okay. But I know you don't like your email because I mean, with the topic you're doing, I can understand completely why. Yeah, for some reason, fascists and proud boys and free percenters don't like me, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, well, and so good. I want to... Oh, okay, get, let's get to your question now, please. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm... I'm trying to figure out how to organize, um, you know, to overcome it and to fight back, to stop the fascism. And some of the ideas maybe you could comment on, um, one has been, you know, to restore kind of anti-corruption laws. Uh, it seems like there's been a steady overturning of the laws, um, honest services laws, fairness doctrine, um, specifically William Casey, uh, you know, the telecommunications, I guess it, it's like re-regulate now, you know, and they, they dismantled all the hard won civil rights regulations. So it's, there's something the honest services laws that were overturned that, um, you know, you can't prosecute a prosecutor, you've got immunity for prosecution. And so I guess, um, you know, if, legal strategies and you've really done a wonderful job but uh i don't know maybe have you any ideas maybe how we could so, at, overturn at, this legally immediately courts, at the international state law local, at the state and local level focus on things like um in wealth taxes um basically increasing state and local taxes on the ultra wealthy um uh restoring taxes on businesses, um, taxing capital gains the same way you would regular income, uh, ending qualified immunity at the, at the state and local level um, would go a long ways. Um, laws that, that, that uh, promote promotional representation or fair districting um, by independent commissions like they have in California or Arizona. Ar the only reason Arizona is even remotely competitive is because years ago they passed um, independent commissionings. Um, uh, opposed gerrymanders in general, um, just for the sake of intellectual and ethical c consistency. Um, uh, try and uh, be involved in local school board races. Um, try and try and do what you can to reestablish local control. Um, can I see? My thought is, why not? If you restore the federal over the state, I think the problem is federalism. Hey pushed everything to the state and local. And so we've got a bunch of grassroots people trying to fight a dictator, you know? So, so the, problem, the problem is, is that Republicans pursued the opposite strategy, which is, which is grassroots up rather than top down. Um, and their six strategies are successful. Democrats, have, I believe, made a heinous mistake in deciding to go for a top down approach when the system and the mathematics are rigged against them. So my, and he, hear me out, hear me out. I don't think the federal's winnable for quite a while. So do what you can to establish local control 
And then if things at the top level continue to deteriorate the way I expect, you want to be in a position to, pu to push your state governments to exert uh, as much autonomy from the federal government as possible to preserve the rights of citizens. Um, the, the, it's at a certain point, um, f anything, any federal control is probably out of reach. There's nothing we can do about the courts at this point for decades, given it's, there's very, very little at this point we can do at the federal level. So well, focus on what you, focus on what you can control rather than the things that you can't. Right, but this yeah. idea of federalism, you know, um, I mean, like, they go back to the Federalist right. Society, yeah. goes back to 1776 yeah. and says, let's restore it to there. And I'm like, well, you know, where were we there when we're designing a new country? It has to be, you know, one country. I mean, hey. right. Um, so hey. Bill of hey. Rights, enforce the Bill hey. of Rights, not the Citizens United. I, I just hey. don't see why the you've got to fix right. it at one system. All right, Ellen, in the interest of time, uh, I'll let uh, our our uh, speaker finished this part off and we got five more questions. So the, one, so. the one thing I'll say, say to that and then I'd like to move on is that one of the problems with American exceptionalism is we assume that the constitution is infallible, the constitution is great, it was, um, it is the, uh, that it's perfect or near perfect uh, and the truth is that it's not, it's allowed us to be overtaken by fascism and at some point you have to recognize the system is broken and you can't fix it and that you have to avoid the sunk cost fallacy. So next question, please. Okay, uh, I got five more. We got Dan, Chris Buss, Robert, Janice Glinsner and Charles Paydock. So Dan, you're next. Or Ileana, Dan, you're next. Okay, all right, I'm next. All right, um, I just have a question. I have a question about Bulgakov and Chekhov and Dostoevsky and Chekhov especially. Now, do you think these Russian writers wrote about fascism or, or not? So I would say that I have only a cursory knowledge of these writers uh, in general, other than having read Dostoevsky in high school. Um, so I don't feel comfortable commenting on something where I lack the expertise to do so intelligently. Okay. And I have a question, very quick, if I may. Hey, Liana, since you're in the same room, we'll let yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, no, just very quick. Uh, thank you so much for your speech. Very, very nice speech. I like it. Everybody thank like you. it. Yeah. So why do you think the system is broken? Why you well, why you this, think? What's your opinion? So the system is broken because nothing can get through and because you have... Uh, one party that's no longer interested in meaningful compromise mm -hmm. in order to improve the system. There is one ideological answer mm -hmm. and they will never back down from it, mm -hmm. um, that they are unable to recognize when a idea is a bad idea or back down from it, giving assault rifles to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and that's, that's clearly doesn't work. Uh, so you think when Trump was in, uh, in power, you think the okay, okay, system, system was better? No, okay, I don't. Yeah. I think the system is broken in that we the system as it stands is incapable of implementing oh. solutions to real problems at this point uh, okay. for, based off of how the Constitution was written, based off of uh, parliamentary rules in Congress, mm -hmm. and based off of one party not being interested in implementing solutions to real problems. Mm, thank you so much. Thank okay, you. let's uh, move on. Thanks, El Ilana and Dan, for your questions. Chris, you're next. Please go ahead. Chris Boss, you're, you're next. Let me make it quick. So, uh, yeah, can you, can you guys hear me or no? Yes, yes we can, can hear, hear you, you, Chris. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I was, because, because you, you came after me, I don't, I don't really understand what you were saying. Okay, so uh, two quick questions. So number one, I was wondering if Brent have uh, been looking at the demographic data. So I think her, your analysis, I will say is more pre-2010, right? In terms of demographic of the Republican party, because by your you know, personal interest, I will actually say that the Republican party demographic is moving to favor you because all the voters that Trump had brought in since 2016 are what I call 
you know, non-educated uh, secular voters that were never really participating in the political process on a regular basis. Um, and they're really here as grievance. But in regard to issue like abortion, uh, you know, transgender rights, and except they will just do whatever, like, say, the top guys say they should do. So if tomorrow Trump says, hey, I love all the LGBT2 people, and we should all be nice to them, these people will say, yes, okay, we'll go, go, go that. They have actually, that's actually what makes them dangerous, because they have actually no ideology whatsoever. Hey, they will Chris, just go with whatever. Can you get to your says. question, so please? what I'm saying, I'm saying, so that is a question. Okay. Uh, the question is, have you thought through that? In terms of how that really factor into the future, you know, way of the election, because I think the deal between the evangelicals and the religious right and Trump, it was a, you know, it was a deal of inconvenience. But the voters that actually make the difference in all the swing votes, all the primaries, is yeah. these people who are secular. So have you thought about that? And I'm going to disagree with you um, on a number of points here, uh, factually. Um, back during the 2016 campaign, initially. Trump was winning with white evangelical voters as his base, but they were the white evangelical voters who attended church less than weekly. After Ted Cruz dropped out, um, he picked up the white evangelical voters who go to church weekly or more. Um, what we've seen since then, according to the data, is that the most fervent Trump supporters are the ones who attend church the most, right? That's the, actually one of the best predictors. White evangelicals who attend church weekly or more are the demographic that is most solidly in the tank for Trump. Trump, ah, excuse me. Um, as far as going wherever Trump says for them to go, like you mentioned trans rights, I'm gonna say no. Um, that fundamentally, uh, an example of this is when Trump started telling people, hey, get the booster, right? Um, get the booster vaccine for COVID, right? You know, um, and his base, which has a, quite a bit of overlap with QAnon and anti-vaxxers, uh, got really angry at him. And the, the turnout at his rallies dropped. Um, and you saw, and that's where you started seeing the first real dip in his popularity with the GOP base going away or dropping a little bit. Now he's down about, you know, you've got, you know, there's something like somewhere between 50 and 60% of Rep Republicans who don't want to see him run again. Um, and what I would say is that I, Based off of that, I don't think voters, Trump so, voters, so, would so go Brett, wherever so, so quickly, them, right? There are so certain I, I don't, beliefs yeah, that they I don't have. Wanna... Okay, uh, Chris, we're going to have we're going to have time for rebuttals later. So, on. No, no, no. I don't. I, don't, I, I want to refer one. So I don't want to go back and forth because uh, whose data is more right. So there's an article on very uh, solid yeah. data analysis published jointly by the Atlantic and New York Times. It's called "What After the Religious Right for the GOP." It came out on June 1st. Uh, I will recommend you read the article and go through the data and see if your view changes. I'm good. Okay, Chris. Uh, okay, thanks. I'll take a look uh, and review the data. All right, uh, Chris, like I said, we will have a chance after question and answer periods for each and everybody to do a little bit of a rebuttal. Okay, I have Robert, Janice Klinser, Charles Paydock, Margaret Gillette, and Raj. So Robert, you're next. Sure. Um, is everything you've said so far, I agree with. Um, I was just wondering, you you mentioned you got a couple more years in this country, and then you know that might be it for you. What countries do you recommend moving to, and why? So uh, a good place to start is to think about, um, are they going to let you in there? You're going to want to think about the strength of the democracy. Um, I would look at the VDEM index. I would look at, oh, God, what, ah, uh, shoot, if they work with USAA. Um, Freedom House. Uh, look at the Freedom House democracy rankings. Uh, look at the um, look at the Economist Freedom rankings or democracy rate ratings. Um, when it comes to what places have strong democracies and strong democratic traditions, um, we're looking at Canada um, primarily because that's where my wife is from and she has citizenship. New Zealand has strong democratic traditions. Ireland, uh, the Nordic countries um, are all on pretty solid footing. Um, uh, Australia still has what I would, has not fallen to ultra polarized um, politics yet. Um, so they're gonna, be, they're gonna be safe for a little while, but 
Overall, we are seeing democracy receding around the world and it is following a very worrying pattern in that we see very similar sorts of philosophies and mindsets and ways that they are eroding democracy. Um, you know, India, Turkey, Hungary, Belarus, Poland um, are all kind of of the same kind. Call me later, okay? I have on the phone here. Okay, hang, hang on. We got a new, we got somebody and they got a mute. But sorry about, sorry about this. Uh, all right, uh, Robert, did that answer your question? Yes. Can I just ask one other small question? Go right sure. ahead, Robert. Okay. What are your thoughts on the, um, on the government's acknowledgement that unknown aerial phenomenon are flying in above, uh, you know, military test ranges and bases across the country? Do you think that poses a national security threat? I don't know because I don't know what they are. Um, I, it's, it's from a logical standpoint. Um, I, I don't know what they are, but concluding that they are aliens heretofore has always proved to be wrong. Okay. All right. On that note, uh, Janice, you're next. Please answer your question and uh, we're ready for you. Janice, you're next. Okay, I have a simple question. Um, yeah, uh, Bryn, does yes, your yes. book have an index? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I guess Charles, you're next. So go ahead and uh, get on, get on yeah, board. Yes, uh, Bryn, um, at the college here, I've had to listen to any number of these conspiracy theories, uh, such as the one that federal employees such as myself have put together a deep state, which has taken control of the nation, the country. Are these conspiracy theories basically anybody who advances them doing exactly what the Republicans want them to do? They're certainly not helpful. Um, I work within, I work adjacent to the federal government and I've seen good federal, I've seen far more good federal employees than I've seen bad ones. Um, and that there are issues with the federal bureaucracy, but it is necessary for the functioning of a modern uh, 21st century country to, with, with a regulatory uh, mechanism. Uh, you, we cannot function without a federal government providing the kinds of things that it does. If you don't have a federal government, you devolve to states going in 20 different directions, and a lot of them are dumb. Um, and the, it, the federal government provides services that, that the states can't for themselves. So is, is there a conspiracy? No, but when, when you see resistance coming within the federal government, Typically, the reason you're seeing resistance is because they're being asked to do something that violates their their morals, or it violates their their professional ethics. Um, is usually when I'm seeing pushback. When you ask when you ask a climatologist to start fudging the numbers or framing a model in a certain way to get an answer that there's no global warming, you get people get angry. When you punish people for being in a climatology office by, you know, relocating them to middle of nowhere, Missouri, right? Of course people are gonna quit. Um, when you ask civil rights attorneys to start, um, you know, um, deciding that um, the religious majority of the United States should have a right to harass and mistreat historically discriminated against minorities just because they're white and Christian or because they're Christian, they're the majority religion, that rubs civil rights lawyers the wrong way. And they, that's when you see resignations and pushback. Um, we saw an ungodly number of members of the Department of State uh, leave. So it's not a deep state, but it is, it's professionals who chafe at being asked or demanded to behave unprofessionally is what I see in my experience. Thank you. Good answer. All right, uh, Margaret Gillette, you're next. So please uh, ask your question. My question has to do with secession. 
I live in Texas. I'm in, fortunately, I'm in Dallas County, a blue <laughs> county. <laughs> but we have always, I mean, even as a child, I think I was told that Texas had the right to secede. Now we're seeing more of these efforts. And it's very interesting what you said that even people who are Democrats are suggesting secession. Democrats uh, in blue areas are more open to the idea. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, yep. just a hypothetical question. What sure. would happen in a state like Texas, which is basically red, if it were to secede? People living here who are blue, Democrats, et cetera, uh, no doubt would have many of their rights squelched and more control. But what about investments and so on? Would the money, if, if a state seceded from the union, would its money even be worth anything? Would the person's uh, 403B plan or whatever plans they had, their stocks, uh, what is your, and this is hypothetical, but what is what do you foresee, Bryn, about those kinds of things? So the answer is God only knows. Um, <laughs> the There are so many, uh, Gordian knots when it comes to what a secession would look like. The fact that blue areas are intensely urban and uh, rural areas are intensely red. You All of the things that you mentioned. Then you've got the 5,200-ish nuclear thermonuclear weapons in U.S. inventory. Um, you've, got the, you've got pipelines, you've got ports, you've got rail lines, you've got um, interstate law, commerce laws, you've got, um, you've got how to decide who would go where, um, how would you divide it up? And the answer is, is God only knows how that would shake out, but there's a good chance it would be messy. I mean, the, Very. I, I, the, 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 honestly, the best case scenario is a dissolution of the Soviet Union and the life expectancy of your average citizen of Russia dropped 10 years, right, in the, in the, in the decade after the dissolution, right? It was, it was catastrophic and oligarchs took over and, human, and we ended, they ended up with Putin and it was, and there were wars, right? You end up, you know, things with like Chechnya and South Ossetia, right? It was, it was brutal. And that's the best case scenario that, that's, that seems even remotely comparable. The worst case scenario looks more like Yugoslavia, right? Yeah. So, you know, we talk about secession um, now, maybe maybe the best case scenario is everybody pretending that we're still a country, but ignoring the government when they feel like it. The example for that would be um, the Kurds in northern Iraq are part of Iraq when they feel like it, and when the you know predominantly Shia Arab government in the south of Iraq, south of them, issues an edict that they don't like. Their answer is, yeah, no. <laughs> No. All, all I'm going to say is uh, Brexit. Mm -hmm. Brexit. It's the it best be, case. But here's the thing is, is from my perspective, mm -hmm. is descent into everywhere being a dystopian nightmare for LGBT people like Hungary and Russia? Mm -hmm. Is that worse? Or is, you know, Kurdistan worse? Or <laughs> Russia worse? You know, the dissolution of the Soviet Union worse? Or Yugoslavia worse? We, we actually had a, a debate on this a while back at the college. I'll pass you the footage, you know, because a, a friend of mine said, his name was, uh, he said, I thought McClellan and these guys settled this from our civil war. Anyway, enough said about that. Raj, you're next. So uh, go ahead, Raj. Unmute Raj and you're next. Okay, thank you. Uh, whom do you see? I think Biden will not make it. Who do you see in the Democratic Party? A probable leader who can really uplift it and win the election in 2024. So, um, personal opinion. I think that Gavin Newsom would probably do the best if it was not Biden uh, running uh, governor of California. Um, but I will caveat with what I said is if the Supreme Court upholds the independent state legislature doctrine in Moore versus uh, Harper next year, the 2024 election is utterly meaningless, utterly meaningless because virtually every purple, st purple state 
swing state legislature isn't going to be held by Republicans who will use the independent state legislature theory to uh, give the electors to whoever the Republican is. We are talking Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida, possibly to probably Arizona are all going to throw their votes that way if the Supreme Court does what I fear they will. So that's, it's a good question, but I'm not sure it's the right question. Uh, I'd like to ask one quick question is that- Sure, uh, Raj. Okay, uh, I'll done quickly, okay? And uh, what, what are the chances uh, uh, that uh, Think the economic economy collapse yes, and uh, and as some tremendous change is taking place, you know that people upset, get very upset, and revolution happen. What happens? Okay, so are you asking if people get really upset, what's going to happen? Yeah, if the economic economic collapses. So I don't know that it's going to be economic collapse. Um, I hate to say it, but you know fascist systems are really really good at propping themselves up. Um, through near slave labor um, or actual slave labor. Um, the thing that I fear that I haven't discussed and I don't really discuss in my current book, but I discuss in detail in my next one that I'm working on is what happens if we reach a point where the majority of Americans regard where we're at as an, an intolerable evil, right? Um, if we reach a point where Americans just, most Americans like this is unacceptable, it is morally unacceptable but they also come to believe that there is no viable, peaceful political solution. And at that point, that's when the possibility of insurgency starts becoming a potential reality, right? We're, right now, we're not there yet. People still think that maybe the system can, can fix itself somehow. But given enough time, given enough atrocities, given enough you know, dead 10-year-old kids that, that, were, that were sexually assaulted by relatives, eventually, we're going to see people take matters into their own hands potentially. And that's, that's how you get an insurgency cycle going. And I think that people might want to take a look at how Italy's years of lead happened as kind of an, as kind of a, I'm not going to say it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's a plausible kind of pathway, right? Um, troubles in Ireland perhaps as well. Thank you. Okay, um, Steve Grossman, you had your hand up earlier, so I'm giving you a chance to uh, to um, to talk unless you're still there. I am here. I will All talk. Right. All um, right, Steve, you're you're next. Am I on now? Yes, you are. Bryn, I, Bryn, I yes, I I think you are brilliant. Uh, your analysis is tight sharp, historical, uh, tragically accurate. Uh, I have to say, uh, I have in my own political development drawn many of the same conclusions as you have. Every aspect of this system, in my opinion, is broken. Uh, if I can take a minute, Tim. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Question, question, the, period. The, well, oh, wait. it's a question, period. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We'll give okay. you a chance to rebut later on. Don't worry about it. It's it's questions and answers, so I'm, I'm asking you if you have a question for Bryn. Okay, I wanted to compliment Bryn. I want to compliment Charlie on getting her here. Uh, speakers of this quality do not grow on trees. Thank you, Bryn. Here's my question. Bryn uh, is a third, what do you think of the potential of a third party to uh, shake up this system and uh, make, it, uh, make it work in the ways that you've been talking about? So third, third party. Here, so I've thought about this and I've reached a, how should I put it? You're almost there, but not in the way you think. Um, 
there is one weird possibility out there that I've pondered, and it's kind of like the, the, the black swan event within a black swan event that somehow s prevents, you know, um, DeSantis or Trump from being president and casting us into 75 years of darkness the way Plessy versus Ferguson did, but worse. Um, the, and that is that DeSantis defeats Trump in the primary. Prime, Trump does not accept the result. You end up with a deeply, deeply divided um, Republican party that splits the vote almost down the middle or takes maybe 50, even if, it, even if it's you know, DeSantis 25%, Trump 20%, the, the, the results of the election are just so brutally lopsided that it gets hard to even make the independent state legislature doctrine work even in red states um, or justifiable. Um, that the, the only way that a third party can save us is not by winning, but by accidentally destroying the GOP. <laughs> uh, basically pulling a Ross Perot, except crazier. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, Kerry, you have a question now, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, since fascists um, tend to be primarily oriented on making themselves richer and believing what they want to believe, therefore denying things like climate change, who's going to win the race of destroying humanity, climate change or fascism? Um, <laughs> so what I'm going to though I've thought about this and I don't address climate change very much but what I'll say is that fascism will make it impossible for us to address climate change because fascism is inherently selfish it's inherently focused on promoting the uh, the interests of the rich and the interests of the rich are much more focused on uh, fossil fuel extraction than they are um, coming up with uh, viable options for the climate and if you look at who the fascists are, they all absolutely despise the concept of climate change. So what I, the, the role fascism has in climate change is that it immobilizes us and prevents us from acting and even encourages the use of fossil fuel. And they essentially represent our doom. Okay. Um, the, the climate change will finish us off. The fascists make sure that we can't prevent it. Okay. All right. Chris, before we get to you on a second round of questions, I do have one for uh, Bryn. Um, I'd like to know what you think about um, the book American Marxism by uh, Mark Levin. Have you ever had, did you get a chance to read it or at least comment about it? Uh, I have not read it. Um, I would put that in the same category as um, standard Fox News propaganda. Um, there is a lot, of, there's the concept of DARVO, which is they project back on us what they see in themselves. Um, they fail, the, what they perceive as the left-wing threat to themselves is essentially a straw man in general. Uh, so I yeah. have not read it and I never really had any particular okay. desire to read something that's pure propaganda because I can absorb that by turning on Fox News at any given minute. Okay. Tim, right. I, I didn't get my first question. In. I, I, that's okay. Kelvin, I'm going to let you go next and then Chris Boss and Ellen Nature okay. go next. I guess what I would say is I don't read things that I consider fundamentally unserious unless there's something to be learned from it. Okay, Kelvin, so go ahead and get uh, uh, Firstly, Brian, uh, uh, can I say thank you uh, I agree with 98, 99% of what you said. Um, the, uh, if you want to know where I come from, then I recommend a song by uh, Billy Bragg, Scouts by the Sun, about R Rupert Murdoch and, and the whole thing. Okay. Um, what I what my question is, given that the, your your present political system, your payola system is, has got to a stage where 20, 20 people in the US decide who you get to vote for for president. And the fact that revolutions, whether they be from the right or the left, do not happen if everything's working, right? 
and the fact that so many people, and I will say this very bluntly, uh, working class people, mostly white working class people, feel so disenfranchised. Do you think the system is worth saving? You, you talk about like uh, preventing the rise of fascism in the US, which would presumably lead to some kind of constitutional reform. Do you think the Constitution of America is worth saving, considering the fact that it's been a, a complete um, disaster every time it's been exported anywhere in the world? It Funny is a failed system. Funny you should mention that. Um, so yeah, it talks about um, how the U.S. Constitution was was copied almost word for word into the Filipino Constitution, and it took them all of six weeks to overthrow it in 1972. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, oh my God! What it's uh, uh, Marcos? It was yeah, Ferdinand Marcos did it. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'm going to disagree with you uh, factually is that it's been debunked over and over again. The Trumpist movement is not a white working class movement in the sense that the average Trump voter is not only more wealthy than the average American; they're more wealthy than the average. Republican voter. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, and I cite that in the book. Uh, there's, there's statistics on it um, that were gathered by 538, Nate Silver's outfit, but it also backs it up with, with a um, peer reviewed study as well. Uh, Brian, Brian I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking to you from, um, from a perspective of a, a Brexit, where the, the what, yeah, yeah. Um, Please, yeah. no crosstalk. All right. Well, Let's move on. Um, sorry, did I answer your question? I'm I'm terribly. Yeah, sorry. actually, you did, you did a little. Um, yeah. Um, okay, we'll go. Uh, uh, well, let's we'll go let's talk real quick about the difference between revolution and insurgency. I I, I do have a secondary question, but uh, let me let me finish address one other thing you said. Okay. Revol it's we're unlikely to get a revolution. Insurgency is another matter. The tools and conditions for insurgency are mostly there. We're not all there, but we're getting there. Um, how, do, how do you feel about the latest poll that said that a third of Americans are willing to take up arms against the government, including 23% of Democrats and 33% of independents? So I think that's interesting, but I think it'll take a while before they figure out that it's Having been through Iraq in 2005, 2006, yeah, I know. I, yeah. That what, what people figure out very, very quickly in insurgencies is it's much easier to kill people that you're, are your opponents than members of the government. And that's what yeah. Americans, if there is an insurgency, well, will figure out. Well, yeah, but how do you feel about that? I, that, that, they, they, that, that, that somebody would, that would say that? I think, Somebody like I said, the conditions, the conditions, the conditions for insurgency are growing. And um, the, Robert's question of why hasn't insurgency started yet? Because the left hasn't bought into, there hasn't been a widespread belief, there isn't a widespread belief yet that the system is both intolerable and broken beyond repair and that there's no peaceful political solutions. Well, when that becomes the dominant Kelvin, narrative, Kelvin, that's Kelvin. Really real danger. Right. Uh, Kelvin, that's it. Kelvin, we got to move on, okay, but thank you. All right, Chris Buss, it's, I know it's a second question, so go ahead, please, Chris. Hey, hey, hey uh, let's limit it to one question and anyone who hasn't asked one. And let's wrap it up. I, I, have, I, I haven't asked one. This is I know. Ellen. I All right, Ellen. It. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lower Chris Boss's hand. I'm going to lower Steve uh, Grossman's hand because you guys have had questions. So, Ellen, go ahead and we'll move into rebuttals. I think that's what Charlie's wanted. Oh, okay. So, I'm wondering whether you have considered the dangers actually and the authoritarian trends of the Democratic Party. For example, the fact that there's there's great they're putting a huge amount of pressure on social media to censor uh, stories, some of which end up being true and important stories, and then um, you know, and then 
yeah, things things like that where where they they are degrading civil liberties. Do you ever think so, about that aspect? So I would say that the quantitative and qualitative data that I have about where the Democratic Party is in comparison with others is that it does not seem to be moving significantly to the right uh, compared with other parties, especially from the perspective of the 3,000 independent experts used in the VDEM project, um, that it's seen as, as a very standard center-left party. Um, I don't see Democrats moving in ways that would be considered particularly anti-democratic yet. Um, they're still playing the politics as normal game. Um, so this is the same Democratic Party we've seen for the past 25 years. Um, with As far as social media goes, um, I would say that social media needs, if it isn't going to self-regulate, it is a source of potential great harm, particularly with things like anti-vax stuff uh, and with organizing for um, we, we know the social media networks were used for organizing the January 6th insurgency. So uh, there are mm -hmm. dangers to a completely uh, unregulated social media ecosystem. Um, now, it would be preferable for social media sites to regulate on their own, for which for the most part they are doing themselves. Uh, what's far more dangerous is the Republican attack on Title 237. Uh, which would make it much easier to, um, for right-wingers to uh, basically throttle access to information on the internet, which I consider a much more severe threat. What is, what is this 237 bill you're talking about? Uh, it's, it's a decision, policy decision made back in the 90s that essentially limits the government's ability to throttle access to information uh, on the internet and to also um, re reduces legal liability for, uh, um, for internet providers and people who put content on the internet uh, for, for lawsuits, um, which, Eliminating that would open Pandora's box, particularly in red states, where they would like to sue out of existence anyone who puts LGBT-related content on the internet, for example. So, okay. Um, now that we've had, uh, I know you had a couple of people had extra questions, but we are uh, running a little bit low on time. The next thing I'm going to do is we're going to go into rebuttals now. And this should be a good place where the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect has a good part that you mentioned earlier, Brad. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious. No comment. <laughs> All right. But honestly, when, when somebody asks me a question, I don't know the answer or I don't have enough experience my answer. I don't know. No, no, I, don't I, I, I know. All right. Let's, let's get into rebuttals. Okay. Raj, I know you got one. Uh, Margaret and Frank, I know you have one. Who else has rebuttals tonight? Charlie's got one. Okay. Who else? Uh, Bob, I have I, one, Ellen. Ellen Corley. Okay. And then Kelvin. Who else? I'll probably have something to say. Uh, okay, Tim. Bob. All right, good. We need you in here because, uh, okay, now I have Raj, Mark, Charlie, Ellen, Kelvin, and Bob. Anybody else? Janice, I know you always usually have something or Steve or whatever. Okay, if not, we got five people so far rebutting. I'll each give you about uh, four minutes. Let me thank our I'm speaker. I'm going to make a real short comment. Let's thank our oh. speaker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, you're right. Let's thank our speaker. Yeah. By the way, Bryn, I must be impressed. I was, I was very happy with, of course, usually book authors are that way, but you, I, I really enjoyed your presentation tonight. Thank you, Bryn. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And anybody else? Okay. I just wanted to go first because it's very short. All right, uh, go right ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll let you go first then. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to I really, I wanted to thank Bryn and I, I found her very well organized um, and very knowledgeable and putting things together in a logical way. And I don't necessarily agree with everything. And I wish she'd have documented or cited some of her stuff on the 
on the thing, but you know, eh. so <laughs> because I've seen charts in other places that were slightly different, but the outcome was the same. At any rate, so I wanted to thank you for your talk and I really appreciate, I know it took a lot of time and you really held it together and you were really logical and, and all of those things. Thank you. Come speak no. again. Come speak again. People want to hear more because it's a okay, really okay. nice book comes out. Um, and I've got another book coming out. Um, maybe we could talk about it. It's about parenting, parenting for transgender youth. Um, are you will come. Are you will come speak again, perhaps. She, I hope she can come back soon. If if you have me back. Well, we we the thing is, we're always looking for speakers of good, high quality caliber, and Charlie usually brings some pretty good people in. All right, the list of rebuttals I have is Mark, Raj, Mark, Charlie, Ellen, Kelvin, Bob, and Carrie. Uh, if that's about it, we'll just get started. I'll each give you guys about maybe four minutes or so. So please, uh, when you're ready, come on in and let's get started. I got a timer here. So uh, excuse Raj. me. Um, uh, Eliana, excuse please. me. No, please, I Eliana. just want to ask Brent to uh, next time come and speak about politics again. Please, Eliana. <laughs> Thank you. She's all set. For, uh, she's muted, Charlie. So, Raj, go ahead. You got the first uh, rebut. Oh, wow. Okay, I got lucky. Okay. Uh, the, some big changes coming. Uh, uh, economy is not going to get in line for the next two, three years. Uh, uh, second, second big change coming is uh, from a Congress and Senate, lots of old people will be retiring and uh, young people will be taking over and uh, that might bring about big changes. Third thing, uh, in the technology, over over the next five to ten years, uh, fusion energy probably come online, and that will change the picture of energy, and uh, that will also change the in a way world works. Next thing is that uh, we have a lots of uh, technology development where people can manipulate lots of things. That is coming, and we are very very rich people and a very crazy people, including Elon Musk and other people who may wipe for power and they might get a fair chance too. So all these things, all these things coming. And uh, one other area, I think I, China is going to be a great power and uh, most of the world will accept for China better than uh, America because uh, Chinese have done one very important thing is that uh, give people a breathing room. Small small countries and other countries, they can breathe well. They are not forced to do anything much. And uh, so that, that is change going to come. I think in, India is going to come up uh, and it will have lots of sway in Africa and uh, South Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. So, the, so these changes, this great changes are coming up. Europe, Europe will have a difficulty handling, managing their own affairs, and uh, Biden have made it very, very complicated by involving involving uh, a permanent uh, semi war between Russia and Europe, and unless they settle it, and perhaps they'll settle it when Biden is gone. And this great, this big change is coming. So world is uncertain, and uh, I, and ultimately I think uh, if not next five years or ten years, uh, country world will be all right and we we'll start progressing. Thank you. Thank you. And my book doesn't cover a lot of the great power competition stuff. It's very U.S. focused. But your 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 comments and points on great power competition and global issues are well taken. Okay, who's next? Um, I believe it would be uh, Raj, Raj went. So Mark, you're next. Mark, if you're ready, go ahead. All right, Mark, you had your hand up earlier. Um, if you're ready to go. 
Uh, if not, then we'll go to you, Charlie. Go ahead. The last. I'll go <laughs> if you want, Tim. Uh, okay, Margaret, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Or Ellen. Ellen, yeah, go ahead, uh, Ellen. We'll get you next. We're, we're okay. limiting people to about four minutes, by the way. So um, okay. go ahead and, and start and do what you need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. I uh, think it's excellent. I agree with 100% of what you said. It, I guess I, you know, it's maybe the theory of how to change it, I am, you know, more anti federalist, uh, anti, you know, um, I guess I've, you know, like you've been trying to just figure out what is this? It's fascism. How can we, you know, change it? And um, I, my background is so different from yours. My stepfather is a fascist, <laughs> really. And luckily I've been raised in Georgia, uh, you know, um, Presbyterian, non-fascist, um, but then my mother married an Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, libertarian, which who made a lot of sense. But I, I guess what I'm saying is I think objectivism, I think a lot of the problem we're dealing with is Ayn Rand's theory of objectivism. Most people don't realize, you know, it sounds good, it's competition, but I've always wanted to like write the opposite book, which is, I guess, subjectivism. And um, I think that's the hope and the danger is that what we had with like John Dewey, progressive education, I, I studied philosophy of education, you know, the philosopher of Dewey and, um, you know, this, I guess, instrumentalism, but just that we have to, in our, if we had an education system, which I think should be controlled federally, um, you know, I think the problem is state by state, city by city, everything's different. And here in Chicago, um, on one hand, I could say we're very progressive, but it's only because it's such a um, police state, it's such a evil fascist machine that, um, you know, that all we have are freedom schools, you know, <laughs> we're like, so I basically have become a, um, a communist, I get an, you know, anarchist. My mentor was a like homeless guy from AA who, you know, um, studied what was Jesus saying. And I, um, I, he said that Jesus was an anarchist and a skeptic. So I, that's my model, you know, but um, I, I've, it's, um, you know, we just have to, I think, get back the institutions that they have um, systematically dismantled, the civil rights and all the, um, all the progressive things. Uh, you know, they used the tricks that you really elaborated brilliantly to, um, to dismantle. And um, I, I just think we should be able to just say, put them all back in. You didn't get to dismantle them, you know. Um, all these, you know, they, and I, I see their tricks. I'm like an informant because I listened to my stepfather's fascist logic for years. And it, you know, you're right on identifying them, you know, with the, um, just the logic of, of this strategy of what they've done. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, it's just taken me so long to believe it. I remember seeing he's a, enemy of the earth. And I'm like, well, why would you say that about him? I mean, you know, he doesn't believe in climate change, but, uh, you know, it's a myth and don't believe it. It's a lie. And, you know, I'm like, you know, but and it, it's so we shouldn't, they shouldn't be allowed to come up with this, right? Um, that's why, I don't know. I just think you should run for office. I try to run for office. Uh, you know, um, I don't know why more people haven't, but uh, I think you're lucky that you came from a trans family. And um, I think that's why you're brilliant. And uh, uh, we need more people like you. So run and, and do come back. And I'm going to read your books. And uh, we have to put our ideas together. OK, thank okay, you. OK, uh, Alan, thanks a lot. Thank All you. right. Uh, <laughs> I have Charlie, Kelvin, Bob, and Kerry. Kelvin, do you want to go next? Yeah, okay. Um, Four minutes, rebuttals. Kelvin. 
It's rebuttals. First off, rebuttals. I, yes, four minutes. I, I'd like to um, report the fact that uh, the state of fact that fascist systems are more efficient than uh, a multicultural oh, I, democratic I, system. Uh, if you if you look at something other than the Hollywood version of uh, the imitation game, you know when he, when when we broke when when the British broke the the the, uh, the Nazi code machine. You've seen the film, yeah. Actually, I agree with you entirely. I wasn't implying that it that was. Yeah, it people... was. It was. A, it was a. It wasn't just. It wasn't just Alan Turing. It was people like Pembroke, uh, and, and there was there was German Jews, communists, gays, everything. Everything that the Nazi Party would have put 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 in a hole in the ground broke their code. So. I, you know, that that is a more efficient. System. The fact is, uh, is it a fascist system, just like uh, a totalitarian uh, social uh, communist system, is inherently inefficient. Um, yeah. Also, I would, I would, I, I would ask, I would like to ask, how do you cross that divide between? The, 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 as, when I look at America now, it's division um i can i can give you one rebuttal on maybe a a, a personal issue to yourself uh, i'll watch the same guy i don't know if you've come across the guy bo the fifth column have you come across that guy no I he's interesting not. um and he would say he was talking about um rural america and transgender issues yeah and uh, how do you talk to somebody from rural America about transgender issues? And he said, well, anybody in a rural area knows somebody who's taken their kid hunting too early. You know, really, then, you know, guys go hunting and it's part of it, you know, with, with carnivores, you know, you shouldn't let, and I personally think that if you don't, if you've got to eat meat, you should be prepared to kill it and dress it because otherwise you're divorcing yourself from the actuality of the event. But sometimes there's a parent that will take a kid to, out hunting too early. But you will never hear anybody in a, in a rural area say to any other guy, call them out. No, you've taken out your kid out too early. You're telling somebody how to raise their kids and anybody you have to you have to talk on a, a on a on a, a mutually acceptable level you know you have to talk about don't preach to somebody about morality take the morality that's there and you uh, and work with that and he said, well, you wouldn't tell that guy how to raise their kids. Why are you telling somebody else how to raise their kids? And Kelvin, about 30 seconds. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much done. Uh, Brian, I, um, I, I, I love what everything that you said. Um, may I recommend... Just for where I am from this moment in time, Scousers Never Buy the Sun by Billy Bragg, a song. Look it up on YouTube. Uh, yeah, uh, type it into the chat, please. Uh, just just uh, give me like 15 seconds. Yes, I agree with you entirely that fascist systems, just like communist systems, are not particularly efficient. Um, I guess I, I, I made my point poorly, which is fascist systems are good at diverting money to the ruling class and keeping them happy, yes. not at being efficient. That's that's part of how they maintain their power. Okay, uh, Bryn, you'll be able to get the last word at after the rebuttals okay. are done. I Sorry. think, Gary. No, no, Bryn, that's just fine. I know I'm being a little bit of a preachy on 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 uh, on um, on uh, rhetoric here. Okay, your house, your rules. No, no. Well, Bryn, we thank you very much for coming tonight. By the way, okay, we got Bob, Carrie, and Charlie. Who wants to go next? 
Uh, Bob Matter, are you there? Kerry's got his hand raised. Okay, Kerry, go ahead. Let's uh, let's go ahead, Kerry. This is a quick yes, maybe no question for Bryn. Is there any chance that short-term climate change, including hurricanes, um, droughts, you know, like water running out of water, wildfires, floods, will cause enough people to change their viewpoint that the GOP cannot suppress their vote and, and, and make and allow for meaningful change? I'm done. Yes, no, yes, maybe no. Almost certainly not, no. Uh, the beliefs are very strong. All right, let's go, to, oh, let's go to Bob Matter. Okay. Um, yeah, um, you know, I, I've heard all these accusations of, of the uh, GOP being, being fascist, but if you look at the actions that they've taken, uh, they don't appear to be fascist. I mean, uh, you know, for instance, uh, here in, uh, in Indiana, uh, we're celebrating this month, July 1st, we became a constitutional carry state. This is increasing our freedoms. We can, we no longer have to go through all kinds of red tape to, uh, to purchase and carry a firearm to protect ourselves, which is our Second Amendment right and our our first and uh, most inalienable right, our first and foremost foremost right of self defense. As long as you're not a uh, felon uh, and you're of legal age, you can buy a gun and carry it. Um, so that that has been more freedom. Usually, fascists confiscate guns, and who wants to confiscate guns? The Democrats. Because when they put all these uh, authoritarian rule, other authoritarian rules uh, in, uh, in, in place, they don't want people to fight against them. Like, for instance, the, you see like the lockdowns they had in Australia, locking people in their, making people stay in their homes. Well, they probably wouldn't have done that the Australian people some, some years before. Um, you know, we've been, we've been, uh, uh, like, there's been a lot of talk about this, uh, about the, about the Supreme Court ruling. And, but you know what, the, the 73 uh, decision, the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, that was, that was a right basically created out of thin air by nine guys. Um, that was not voted on by the people. And it's not in the Constitution, the, anything about ab abortion. Uh, so the Supreme Court has rightly said, hey, this is not our purview. Throw this back to the states. You know, anything that's not expressly said in the Constitution should be, you know, uh, voted on by the states. That puts it in the hands of the people. Let the people vote on it. And if uh, people want to live in a state where they, you know, you want to live in a blue state where it's, you can murder babies uh, a second before they're born and you have, uh, you know, and you give out, uh, you know, free needles to fentanyl addicts, or, you know, free drugs and pills. And you got, you know, people living in squalor, you know, drug addicts and people on welfare and food stamps and, and all that, instead of working, you know, that that's fine. Then you could go there and do that. But some of us would want to live in States where life is, uh, is, uh, you know, ha has value. And uh, I personally felt that uh, I, I was actually, you know, uh, I would say leaning for abortion years ago, when, you know, when it, when it came out, because I don't really have a dog in the fight. I, I, I don't have, I'm not married. I have no children. Uh, but, uh, but I, I was going, you know, going along with it. But then uh, after reading, you know, history and seeing all the, uh, films about about the holocaust and stuff i thought you know maybe this 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 murder of these millions of babies every year maybe this is causing us to devalue life and you see these kids in chicago there's it's not uncommon for a 14 15 year old kid oh, one minute, to, rob, to rob somebody and gun them down and kill them it's like life has very little value because we show that life has no value anybody can just you know go out and, and get an, an abortion um, 
and up to and up to you know now they're talking about you know no, no limits they want to be able to you know kill the baby right after delivery or even up, up before delivery which to me is infanticide and i think well no i think we sh i think we need to have a, a value on life and i think by doing that we'll help correct some of the other problems our society has gotten sicker like with the uh with the school shootings and things like that that's a, that's a far deeper problem that's you know we've we've taken away personal responsibility we've got the breakup of the family all these kids basically have fatherless homes etc so okay can you uh, wrap it up Bob, please? yeah so I, I would recommend everybody to uh uh, to, to also read uh, American Marxism by Mark Levin. I'm about halfway through it. I've, I'm finding it's it's an outstanding book, and I think uh, it would probably be good to read uh, Bryn's book and Mark Levin's book and then make your own decision. And uh, I am not afraid to let people speak freely what they think, like on Twitter. And uh, I don't think it's correct that some people are more equal than others, which is another uh you know, column in the, in the democratic pillar, for instance, uh, you cannot call, uh, a trans, you know, man, a, a, or a trans woman, a man, or use a column of him and you'll be banned on Twitter. So, I mean, you sh that to me means that some people have more rights than others, that, that some people can, uh, direct what you're allowed to say or not. And I, I disagree with that. I could go on a lot more, but I hope to see Bryn back and we'll take up this conversation later. All right, Bob, thanks a lot. And I know okay. Charlie, you're next, so go ahead. All right, let's uh, let's thank our speaker once again for a very, very articulate presentation. Uh, I've got four issues that I will cover. Uh, number one, Calvin, children should never be taught how to use guns, weapons, or taught to hunt very simply, at no age is it appropriate. Uh, children should not have access to guns, nor should adults. Uh, that's very simple. I don't know what area, what direction you're going with that. Number two, Bob. Um, uh, no, uh, well, uh, if you would hey, like to talk about this, I'll talk about it later, hey, but you got the order. Again. He's out of order. Kelvin, let, let's, it's time <laughs> for Charlie to rebut. Number two, Bob. Uh, I'm glad to hear what direction Indiana is going. Indiana, to me, is just simply a place you why have to pass through on occasion to get to someplace else. Uh, it's like stepping back in time. It's like in a time warp. So I'm not concerned what they do in Indiana. Number three, Bryn, I have asked probably thousands of questions here at the college. And I must say, you gave the most articulate answer that I have ever received from a speaker, and much to your credit. And I mean that sincerely. Thank you. You were right on the target, right on the money. And number four, the other thing I'd like to talk about is that on occasion, you had a bullet point that the United States, Trump had brought in unqualified members of the cabinet. People don't realize that members of the cabinet are the people, are the chiefs in charge of each agency of the government. There are executive agencies, but for the most part, and I've had to work for them, these political appointees on, a, on many, many occasions. That was, that was my job. Uh, career, career, career employees had advised these political appointees. And I must say that that administration had without, without oh, every single one of them, amazingly or not, were totally and absolutely unqualified. And yes, much to their credit to federal employees, slow walked their crazy notions. Agencies were headed up by absolute nincompoops. But that's as my direct observation was, it's amazing that this nation survived the cabinet level officers of, of that uncal unqualified, absolutely and totally. Anyhow, thank you very much. Please come again when you got another one in you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have a rebuttal for uh, Bryn? If not, uh, Bryn, we got about 15 minutes or so left. And if you need to go a little longer, go ahead. You get the last word and uh, plug your book. Tell us what you think and uh, 
whatever you got to do, uh, plug away. So my book is American Fascism. You can find it at transgresspress.org. Uh, you can find it in um, hard copy or electronic version. There is an audiobook version coming, um, hopefully within the next couple months. Uh, we got the artist recording it currently. Um, I'm working. I've got another book coming out. Uh, it's a I'm acting as the editor. Uh, it's a book uh, of frequently asked questions and question and answer advice from experts and parents, uh, parents of trans youth on raising trans youth. Um, that book will be coming from Jessica Kingsley Press uh, in February of 2023. Um, I'm somewhere through the lit review and the initial draft of a uh, follow-on book, um, publisher to, to, to be determined. Um, as far as uh, what's going on, um, you know, the, the rebuttal I would offer um, what separates this freedom and fascism. Um, New Zealand is an entirely free and democratic country with a functioning system that is capable of addressing real problems with a functioning government. Um, the idea that somehow being able to arm yourself to the teeth is what makes you free um, is kind of overly simplistic and it doesn't make society better in any way, shape or form. I'll point out um, that the origins of the second amendment, which includes the words well-regulated militia were insisted upon by the South because they wanted to make sure that their slave patrols were armed. Um, the, we had uh, the Supreme Court talk about how it was only in very recent years that it was regarded as this uh, inalienable personal right. Um, it doesn't particularly make us safer. Having a, having a gun and a concealed carry um, is kind of a very white privilege thing to say. Talk to Philando Castile about how that worked out for him. Oh wait, he's dead. Um, it's worth mentioning too that when you look at who the victims of mass shootings are, it's children, it's people in synagogues, it's people in liberal churches, it's people in black churches, it's people in um, Buffalo. This is having virtually unregulated firearms trade uh, doesn't make us freer, it makes us debtor, okay? Um, it doesn't, it, do, it does not benefit our society. The American, the American life expectancy is significantly lower because we have such access to firearms. It's not mental health. It's not video games. It's the completely unregulated, almost completely unregulated access to firearms. There's 400 million firearms in the U.S., 20 million assault rifles. To give you an, give you an idea, um, the two main firearms issued to U.S. troops in World War II were the M1 Garand and the M1 Carbine. Um, we produced about 11 million of those total, compared with 20 million assault rifles that are free among the populace today. Um, so that's not exactly what's making free. We're talking, there was some outright misrepresentations uh, using terms like murdering babies or uh, killing baby, full-term babies immediately after their, seconds after they're born. That's simply not how abortion works. Um, that's an exaggeration used as agitprop to get people irrationally angry at a topic that is complex and that the rules for abortions also Pre, uh, prevented uh, third, third trimester abortions under Roe. Uh, the consequences that we're seeing here are that uh, it's essentially impossible to get an abortion even if you are literally dying because doctors are so worried that they are going to you know, be accused of a crime. So you have women bleeding out. You have women that are being sent home um, that they're refusing to perform the abortion because it's an ectopic pregnancy, but they're still getting a polar pulse um, out of it. Not a heartbeat, just a electrical pulse because there's no vascular system at this point at seven or eight weeks. Um, this is going to induce all kinds of things like trying to arrest women for trying to escape to other states. This sets us up for Dred Scott too. Um, this is the, the pointing at Oh, look at these people in Chicago. This is this is bordering to me on racism of oh look black on black crime, right? This is very Tucker Carlson. 
um, and it makes me distinctly uncomfortable. Uh, mentioning uh, needle exchange programs and the like, uh, when Mike Pence went after needle exchange programs uh, in Indiana, uh, we ended, with the, ended up with the largest AIDS outbreak since the Reagan administration in Indiana. Um, there are reasons why we have public health experts that look at these problems who use data, statistics, and the best research available to make decisions rather than gut reactions to, uh, to it without any actual research or um, at thinking about what the downstream effects are going to be. And right now the U.S. is making decisions that are going to have ugly downstream effects. What is going to happen after we have women dying because they can't get access to safe abortions? What is going to happen when the United States passes 30 million, 40 million assault rifles and you have a population that no longer believes that they can achieve, democrat achieve change democratically, but that the situation is morally intolerable? We're going to see the end of same-sex marriage. We're going to see the end of the ability for trans people to, um, to be able to change their names or get birth certificates or get passports. What we're seeing is we're seeing an increase of armed militias showing up to pride events, people with assault rifles. When we talk about uh, violence with guns that is politically motivated, 75% of politically motivated violence with guns comes from the right wing and only 4% from the left wing and about 18% from other sources, right? So we are embarking in an experiment in bad policy decisions on the grandest of scales possible to make us less democratic, more divided, more well-armed than any society in the history of the universe. We're better armed than the American freaking infantry forces of World War II. Um, <laughs> and this, we're doing this at a time when we're when we have, and I'm gonna bring out the book right now because it's right here behind me. Um, this guy right here, my postgraduate work was on forecasting genocide and civil war. This guy right here was one of the main sources I relied on. There's another book up there by Barbara Walter. She was one of the other main sources. They both pres this guy built the model for the US Army in predicting when you're gonna end up with civil war. Um, Barbara Walter, um, did the predictions for the for the pit of political instability task force version four and five models for the CIA and uh, depart the uh, Department of uh, State, uh, and I took that model and I improved on it. But they're saying we're heading for civil war, and their 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 views from people who 15 years ago were the people that never thought we'd be looking at the U.S. and I never thought I'd be looking at the S. U.S. I'm looking at this, and we are at a we are heading to a Dred Scott two situation, and we're doing it with a populace that at this point fundamentally hates each other, can't talk to each other, and a broken political system that's incapable of a, not just affecting change but addressing real problems. And this is setting us up for a situation that is ugly, beyond description, ugly. And you know, going back to what I discussed, you know, uh, uh, talking about, you know, the death of expertise. You know, we no longer trust experts in epidemiology and people who study the statistics of violence, who study, we forbade the US government from spending any money to investigate the links between gun ownership, violence, suicide, death, and crime, right? Because literally the gun industry did not want us to have data and analysis uh, on these sorts of things. So, you know, I mean, I respect his right to say it, but fundamentally this is part of the larger problem is we're not trusting experts. We're not looking at what makes these, the data and analysis from actual experts or what makes a livable, viable, functional society and instead, we are taking an ideology, throwing it at the wall, and seeing what happens. And what happens is you have a murder rate in the US, you know, ungodly number of times higher than anywhere else in the world. 
because of our abortion restrictions, we're already seeing maternal and infant mortality rates higher than anywhere else in the developed world. When you look at our uh, mortality rates here, we're somewhere between Nicaragua and Mexico at this point. Um, you know, these, these are not things to be proud of. This is a nation in decline, and it's a nation in decline because we have a political system that has allowed itself to be rigged, and we have one party making decisions not based off of any kind of intellectual curiosity or evidence or research or expertise, but purely based off of ideological lines with the belief that, that if you pursue, if you do things based off of an ideology, you can only achieve good results. That if you give everybody you know, an AR-15 or allow everybody to have an AR-15, things are gonna be just ducky. And that's almost the definition of insanity because as we have added more and more um, assault weapons, the number of le massively lethal mass shooting events has risen and risen and risen and risen. You know, the same thing with climate change. You know, it just keeps getting warmer and warmer and warmer and we still have people denying it or saying, well, it's just, we want cheap gas. Cheap gas is more important, right? The America has decided you know, Ben Franklin, and I mentioned this in chapter 11, is that every democracy that ever was committed suicide by stupidity. And that's exactly what we're doing right now, right? Um, you know, this is, you know, part of me wonders, you know, would, would people be this in favor of guns if instead it was, you know, instead of synagogues and black churches that were getting where people were showing with the AR-15s and mowing people down, if it was every other week, it was in a Southern Baptist church, right? Would their tune about gun ownership be the same? You know, but right now as a trans person, I recognize that what we're seeing is a fascist movement. The same way Hannah Arendt recognized that what she saw coming from the National so Socialist government was inherently dangerous to her and her family. And she left and she got death threats. And I get death threats fairly routinely and lots of people telling me that I need to die or that I'm a tranny cunt or whatever. But as I watch the level of, the more and more violence I see being called for, the uh, stepping closer and closer to those levels of violence, the use of pedophile and groomer language to describe people like me, the talk increasingly that trans people should not exist. The fact that democracy is going away and that it will, it's very soon about to become impossible to change the government via voting, and it already is impossible in many swing states where it theoretically should be possible because you don't know who's gonna get the majority of votes. You know, I'm trying to, who, do you, who should you trust to detect on rushing fascism? the person that's gonna be most affected by it or the person who's not going to be affected by it in the slightest. Mm. Okay, Brynn, is that the end of your comments? I think so. All right, I, All wanna, right. I just wanna give you a couple of uh, things that might offer a little hope for you. It's, I'm just gonna basically- Oh no, Timmy, Tim. Char Charlie, yeah, this, no. is very, this is it's very relevant. It's her program, it's her program, please. Charlie, please. I'm just gonna give you- No, a no, Tim. Thank Charlie, speaker. shut up. I'm going to share my screen. I'm no, Tim, uh, we, we asked you not to do this before. Charlie, I'm going to show uh, you. Uh, every time you share the screen, I, I lose your feed. Okay, no, no, it's just very simple. There's two and, simple and resources. The, Republic, the, Repu the Republican Party just recently, a couple of lawyers just published a book on, um, from, it was called Lost Not Stolen. They went and thoroughly debunked all of the Trump Trumpian things on the election. I just want to show real quick what the screen is and maybe yeah, our, this is not according to our format now. Uh well we're we're taking a no, little no, no, no. sorry I, yeah, well, Tim, I object. All right then we'll oh, let him do it. Let him no, do it. No, he's got to follow the rules. He does this other this speakers is, have objected to this. Brynn, do you want to see him? Um, send them Listen, to me via Tim, email. Tim, I've been talking to you. I'll send them to you via email. All right, if you can't follow the rules, well, don't be the chair. obviously we have uh, something here. All right. Anyway, the chat. 
You had a chat set for the Republicans. Oh, yeah. I, said, I, I said scouts don't buy the sun. We're going to thank our speaker, Bryn. You can stick around. We're going to have a little bit of a right. Thanks very much for right. having me. All right, and we're going to conclude the college tonight by stopping the recording. I have, I have one more question for Brad, if I might, before you switch to um, Well, let's auto, go ahead, Kelvin. We'll, if, if, if uh, Brad, sure. I, I have thoroughly enjoyed your talk tonight. You've been so erudite and pushing it on the door. Uh, what, the question I have to ask is, have you thought about running for office? And <laughs> if not... No, but, she writes books. Uh, is, there any, is there any politician you would uh, endorse or any political movement you would endorse? Um, I'll just tell you who, um, uh, during the last election, I supported um, Elizabeth Warren. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, she was closest to me in general in terms of outlook. Okay, really? Elizabeth Warren, not Bernie, no? No, a little bit, close, uh -oh, a little bit closer no. to Elizabeth Warren. Okay. Really? You, you endorse the corporate Democrats? I think she's got a good point, though, Kelvin. All right. Okay, all right. I asked the question, I've got an answer. I'll all right, on this note, then we're going to conclude the college, and then we'll stick around for a little bit of the after party.